second day of our five days faculty development program on applied mathematical skills for science and engineering using contemporary tools. We are organizing this FDP from our applied science department of Macau W in collaboration with Islamic University of Science and Technology, Jammu and Kashmir, sponsored by Tekki. Today in this panel, we have Professor Dr. Shukhendu Shamazar, the Director of School of Natural and Applied Science Department, Professor Rathapallo Khaur Sir, HOD of Applied Science Department, our distinguished speakers, Professor Amitabha Singha from Macau WB, Professor Dr. Shamojit Kaur from NIT Durgapur, Professor Shamuresh Pal from Kollani University. My colleagues, Dr. Atre Bishash Madam, Dr. Shankar Prashad Madhosat from Applied Science Department, and I am Anesha Shigupta. I believe that our participants will enjoy the full session as the whole five days FDP program includes many interesting topics and very, uh, many practices of mathematics. Without taking any more time, let us start our lecture session. I welcome cordially our first keynote speaker, Professor Amitabha Singha sir from PLSI Department of Macau WB. Let us first introduce him. He had, uh, sorry, Professor Amitabha Singha sir is an uh, eminent teacher from our PLSI Department of Macau WB. He had published more than 80 research papers in reputed international journals. His areas of interest include embedded system design, VLSI design, digital signal processing, etc. Professor Singha is a fellow of the Institute of Engineers and the recipient of obtained Indian Leadership Award for Education Excellence from Indian Economic Development and Research Association, New Delhi, India, in the year of 2013. The title of his speech is Application of Laplace Transformation in the Engineering Sciences Problem. I request Professor Singha sir to kindly deliver his speech. Sir, please. Oh, thank you, Anesha. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Oh. It is still so not visible. The screen is not visible. Yes. No, no, no. Okay. No, sir. So are you sharing? Uh... Yeah, just a minute. Zoom <laughs> Is it, it is now visible, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, it, it is now visible. Oh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yes, sir. So, can I start now? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, respected panelists and respected faculties. The topic of discussion is application of Laplace transforms in engineering science problems. Now, Laplace, this concept, Laplace transform, was introduced by P.R.S. Simon Laplace 
was a French mathematician. He began work in calculus, which led to the Laplace transforms. So let's have a look at what's the purpose of Laplace transforms. The purpose of the Laplace transform is to transform ordinary differential equations into algebraic equations, which makes easier to solve ordinary differential equations. But how? Now, in fact, we all know that integral differential equations are rather hard to handle, whereas the algebraic solutions are always simpler, as algebraic equations are easy to handle. Now, Laplace transform converts a function of a positive real variable, usually time, to a complex function of complex variable. So rather, very often we say that uh, conversion from time domain to frequency domain. In fact, after solving algebraic equations, you can take the reverse transforms to get the solutions. So Laplace transform is particularly useful for solving ordinary differential equations in many areas, including electrical circuits analysis, mechanical systems, physics. In fact, if we compare Laplace transforms with our logarithmic transformations, we can understand it very easily. Now, we use the log table. Rather, what we do, if we take the logarithmic, we transform it to log domain. Say we want to multiply two number A and B. So log A plus log B equal to log AB. So if we want to multiply by additions, we can do it, of course, in the log domain. And after that, we take the inverse logarithm and we get the solutions. In fact, Laplace transform also operates in a similar fashion. To understand it, let's take an analogy. Let's say the task is to lift a pair of dumbbells from the floor and to place them on the table. Let's say that's the task. It's really hard you know, to do it manually. So all that will require an engineering approach. Now what's that? So bring an instrument so that the dumbbell could be placed on the table. But look, you know, it doesn't work because the lift cannot be entered onto the room. So then what we have to do? Change the position of the table and the dumbbell. So bring the table out of the room and taking the instrument to lift it. The problem is solved. But really, it's not really solved because still in the table is outside the room. So to complete the job, push it back to the room. So exactly Laplace transform functions in that form. So it's a method that converts differential equations in the time domain to algebraic equations in complex domain. So it is defined as Laplace transform of a function t, ft, equal to ft e to the minus st dt integrations zero to infinity. Exactly, you know, zero minus to infinity we tell uh, to indicate the initial condition. Zero minus means just before zero, whatever the initial conditions will be, that has to be considered. Because in real life problem, we see that initial conditions are very important. We'll shortly uh, discuss those things when we'll go to the applications. So continuity and restrictions, so these are also there in fact. Since the general form of Laplace transform is that what we discussed just now, it makes sense that ft must be at least piecewise continuous for t greater than or equal to zero. If ft is not bounded by m e to the power vt, then the integral will not converge. And if the integral doesn't converge, that means the system for which you know, we are applying this will not be stable. So how to use Laplace transforms? Find differential equations that describe the system. Any system can be described by differential equations, input and output. Then we can take the Laplace transforms sometimes. And once we take Laplace transform, we get the algebraic form. So perform algebra to solve for output or variable of the interest. 
and applying inverse transforms, we can get the solutions. So now we discuss some of the properties of Laplace transforms. It follows the linear law. Like if F1s is a Laplace transform of F1t, and F2s is a Laplace transform of function F2t, and C1 and C2 are constant, then Laplace transforms of C1 F1t plus C2 F2t will become C1 F1s plus C2 F2s. So here are the proofs in fact, you can see it. Scaling in time. Laplace transforms of a function AT is equal to one by A, capital F S by A. So time shift, f t minus 0 into u t minus t 0 equal to e to the power minus s t 0 in the address. So these formulas will be helpful when we will go for applications. Similarly, shifting, frequency shift, e to the power minus a t into f t. If we take the Laplace transform of this, then this becomes capital F s plus a. Differentiations, first let's see, multiplications by t to the power n. So this is the function t to the power n into ft. And if we take the Laplace transforms, it becomes like this. Similarly, if we take the integrations, let's say integration of ft, it becomes fs by s. If we take differentiations of function ft, it becomes s of fs minus f0 plus, it indicates the initial condition. Similarly, these are for nth order derivatives. So Laplace transforms of, if, if ft is one, then Laplace transforms of ft will become one by s. If the function is exponential function, exponential decaying function, e to the power minus at, it will become one by s plus a. Now, most important functions are sine and cosine functions. So Laplace transform of sine and cosine functions, how it could be derived, let's have a look at it. We know that Euler's formula, e to the power j omega t equal to cos omega t plus j sine omega t. So if we take the Laplace transforms of this, it will become one by s minus j omega, because e to the power j omega t, Laplace transforms of e to the power j omega t will be one by s minus j omega. And that means Laplace transform of cosine omega t plus j sine omega t will be like that. So since it's a linear system, it follows the laws of linearity. So Laplace transform of cosine omega t plus j sine omega t becomes Laplace transforms of cosine omega t plus j Laplace transforms of sine omega t. Okay. One by s minus j omega, that, that is equal to s by s square plus omega square plus j omega by s square plus omega square. So real part cosine omega t, and here the real part is s by s square plus omega square. So Laplace transforms of cosine omega t will become s by s square plus omega square, and that of sine omega t will omega by s square plus omega square. Now let's have a look at some important function. We call them special functions. Now, one of the most important function is the impulse function. Now, in a mechanical systems where delta t is a force, so the total impulse will become I of tau will become integration of del tau d tau from t0 minus tau to t0 plus tau, a small period. So let's say d tau equal to c for this period, t less than or equal to t0 minus tau, t0 plus tau, t0 minus tau, within that, this is the range. So then impulse of the force will become twice tau into c. Now, if I say 
if we just assume that c equal to 1 by 2 tau then this will become 1 okay now this is the concept of unity impulse so area if we see this graph here we find a rectangle so height is 2 tau and here in the base plus tau minus tau so the length will be twice tau and height is also 2 tau okay now 1 by 2 tau so, so total area is 1 now let's say if we just squeeze that base the width but total area will say 1 so as in fact this is getting synced the height will become higher higher and higher so when the limit tends to 0 for tau this will become infinite this is in fact the historical concept of Dirac delta functions so we can say that delta function is del t dt equal to 1 that is the area and del t equal to 0 when t is not equal to 0 and this will become infinite for t equal to 0 if we just see the previous slide we can see that at t equal to 0 it becomes infinite so Dirac delta function the same thing is described as formally del tau del t equal to 0 for t not equal to 0 equal to infinite at t equal to 0 that red sign you know that indicates the value is indefinite and the area is 1 del t dt this is also called unit impulse or generalized impulse so del tau pi t dt that becomes pi 0 so if any function is multiplied by del t and integrated over this period it becomes phi zero that means that particular function which is known as a test function the value at t equal to zero so what is the laplace transform so unit impulse now at t equal to zero it is your minus s t equal to one so laplace transform what we are calling at del s since it's a delta function, this del t into 1 dt, del t dt equal to 1. So Laplace transforms of unit impulse is 1. Now, uses of delta functions. The modeling of electrical, mechanical, and physical phenomena, point charge, impulsive force, point mass, point light, and all these applications, delta function is very important. Now, if we integrate delta functions, we'll get step function, ut, what is known as unit step functions. If we integrate ut, we'll get tut, the first order, this is known as ramp function. And if we integrate tut, we'll get parabolic function, t square by 2 ut. And in that way, if we keep on integrating, we'll get nth order. So this is unit step function. So it is defined as ut equal to 1 for t greater than 0 and ut equal to 0 for t less than 0. So what is the Laplace transforms of unit step? It is a minus s t f t dt by definitions. So that becomes 1 by s. Now, if we multiply a function with e to the r minus del t. Now e to the r minus del t is what? Is basically a decaying function. Now if a decaying function is multiplied with sine or cosine functions, it will be what? It will be a damped oscillations. Since cosine omega t is a oscillatory functions and once it is multiplied by a an exponential function, decaying exponential functions, then the function will look like that and slowly slowly it is decaying and multiplications by ut you must have noticed that here there are three functions it is the minus del t cosine omega t and ut and this third function ut why it has been done to make the system causal 
the signal will be causal in the sense there won't be any thing in the negative sense it will start from zero now u t equal to 1 what t greater than equal to 0 otherwise it is zero so once it is multiplied by u t the negative half negative portion will be deleted totally so that's why it looks like that it start from zero and slowly slowly it is getting tied down similarly another example has been given this is not exponential function these are subtractions of delayed functions now ramp functions laplace transforms of unit ramp function if you see equal to t to the minus st so the laplace transforms will become 1 by a square the name a ramp is you know is is just like a straight line equation which passes through origin so here's a table for or some selected laplace transforms like ft if it is ut then 1 by s if it is to the minus 80 into ut that is ut multiplied by decaying exponential function laplace transform becomes 1 by s plus a so for cosine it will be a square plus a square plus 1 for sinusoidal is 1 by a square plus 1 again you know multiplications by ut indicates to make the function causal causal means or uh, when t equal to minus 0 the function will have zero value this yes? to uh, get the concept of the reality this minus 0 in physical system doesn't exist similarly t to the power n ut to n factorial by s to the power n plus 1 so if n equal to 0 then the function becomes ut and this is 1 by s so this is generalized form if it is del t then the laplace transform will 1 so <coughs> we have already discussed for differentiations and integrations and these are the table for laplace transforms a region of convergence that is also very important that of uh, region of convergence means the region where it converges if it doesn't converge in fact you cannot take the laplace transforms of that function it has to be converged like 1 by s plus a let's say x1 s in the transform domain is 1 by s plus a now we'll introduce the concept of poles and zeros poles means the value for which the function of course in the transform domain will become infinity and zero means if it becomes zero now here let's say x1 is equal to 1 by s plus a if a is equal to minus a then it is infinity and if the region of convergence greater than minus re a so here it will be not in that after minus a okay it will converge this is another example the region of convergence if the real s is less than minus re of a is the second example so region of convergence will be after minus a there are some examples that have been given like if it is c by s minus 2 minus 2 by s plus 1 so here region of convergence will be a is equal to 2 and a is equal to minus 1 that means it will be after my s equal to 2 it cannot be in that size so basically in fact our intention is to solve differential equations and already you have discussed you know how the differential equations by transformations will be solved let's go through some applications of laplace transforms uh, which will be more interesting there are various applications like analysis of electronic circuits to solve quickly differential equations occurring in the analysis of electric circuits system modeling is to simplify calculations in systems modeling now systems when we model the systems we have to know the behavior of the systems and this behavior will get to know by giving a certain particular input for the outputs we are getting and getting the relations between output and input uh, in transforms domain 
will get the Casper functions and that will give the characteristics of the systems. So we can do the modeling of a system in the areas of nuclear physics in order to get true form of radioactive decay. In fact, uh, to study the analytic part of nuclear physics. Now, process control is one, uh, one of the most important areas. Uh, to analyze the variables which, when altered, produce desired manipulations in the result are used to solve the differential equations occurred in this field. Again, in the process control, uh, is basically deals with the controlling the system. And again, the system behavior that can be simulated by Laplace transforms. And we can analyze the whole systems. So mechanical system analysis, vibration analysis, these all are the areas of applications. Now, let's have a look at the electric circuit analysis. Now, in the electric circuit analysis, we know that uh, this is from the Ohm's law, VIT equal to RIT, that is voltage at a particular time instant is R into IT. If we take the Laplace transforms, this VT becomes VS, this is the Laplace transforms of VT, and IS is the Laplace transforms of IT. So VS becomes R into IS. Similarly, this is for inductance. We know that uh, Vt equal to LDIDT, which comes from Faraday's laws of electromagnetic inductions. And I0 is the initial current. Then the equations will be Vs equal to SLIS minus L, LI0. I0 is the initial current and IS is in this way. This for capacitance. So if we have a circuits like or inductance and resistance, we can use the Kirchhoff's law, like total voltage here is 336 volts. That is equal to volt equal to uh, 8.4 into LS plus 42 into this. If I1 is the current and I2 is the uh, current in the outer path, then we can form this Kirchhoff's equations and taking the Laplace transforms, we can find out the current equation I1 is equal to 10s plus 90 by 42 and so on. And then by partial fractions, we can form like I1 is equal to uh, 15 by 8 minus 14 by s plus 2 minus 1 by s plus 12. And then by taking the inverse transform 8.4 to the minus 2t and so on. So that means for electrical circuit analysis, we can use the Laplace transforms. First, uh, draw the circuit and take the cut jobs, current equations, current voltage equations, and take the Laplace transforms. And after that, getting the algebraic form, to simplify this algebraic form by partial, partial fractions methods, and then take the inverts to get the solutions. So, so simply, we are getting the solutions of the equations. So these all are the different circuits and their analysis by Laplace transforms. Now let's have a look at Laplace transforms for mechanical system analysis. The basic elements of mechanical systems are the mass spring and shock absorber or damper. These are the basic elements. Like Basic elements of uh, electrical circuits or electrical systems are inductors, capacitors, resistors. Here also similarly in the mechanical systems, these are mass, spring, and shock absorber or damp damper. The mass, the spring, and the damper, the basic actuate also. The study of movement of mechanical system corresponding the analysis of dynamic systems. In fact, in robotics also, the same thing is applicable. Now here, the basic elements, this is the spring and this is the damper, they have been connected. So if a force, external force, FEXT, at a particular instant T is applied, then what will happen? The spring 
if we apply the force from the left hand to right hand sides, then spring will store the energy. And in fact, this damper will try to resist it. And you can write the equations for that, which will look exactly like same like electrical circuit equations. We'll see that. Like, similarly, the structure of a robot can be analyzed with all this and basically a 3D body which can be rotated about three orthogonal axis. This, uh, this we call pit, here and roll. So degree of freedom we can define and different components are connected over there. And these components, exactly like the electrical circuits, if we form that, then we can analyze. And finally, a differential equation will be formed. So, <coughs> excuse me. Mm. Before that, let's go to electromechanical analogy. Okay. If we understand the electromechanical analogy, then it will be easier for us to uh, frame the differential equations and then to solve it. Now, this electrical and mechanical systems exhibit similar behavior and thus their system equations are also similar. And it was observed by James Clerk Maxwell in 19th century. This phenomenon is known as the electromechanical analogy, as I told you. Let's look at this, a mass. If a force is applied to a mass, we know that it will generate the accelerations. So F equal to M into d 2 x dt square or M into dv dt, rate of change of velocity, or rate of double differentiations of this uh, x displacement. So M into d 2 x dt square or M into dv dt. Now an inductance, if we apply an electrical force, okay? So once we apply the electrical force on that, V equal to L D I D T. I is the current. Now, nature of both the equations are exactly the same. Here F equal to M D to D V D T. This small f corresponds to mechanical force. And here capital V corresponds to electrical force. That means M is equivalent to L and DVDT, rate of change of velocity, and here rate of change of current. This is the flow of charge. Now, L and M, if we see more critically, mass means the inertia property, and inductance also has the inertia, inertia property. If we go by Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction, so you'll find that it will try to oppose the voltage. So both of them are behaving exactly in a similar fashion. Now here, analogy between damper and resistor. The resistor is doing what? Resistance will try to oppose. So V equal to IR and here F equal to B dx by dt. So here B represents the frictional force constant. This corresponds to resistance in the electrical network. And here, the spring. Spring is basically, you know, it stores the energy. When you are giving the force corresponding to that, it stores the energy. And F equal to K vt. And here, the capacitor, it also stores the charge. That means it's storing the energy V equal to 1 by C integration of I dt. And river is a transformer, basically. You know the transformer. Either you can just uh, increase the voltage or decrease the voltage level in the output. So it depends on the number of turns in the transformers. And here also the lever, you can write the equations. F1 into this distance equal to F2 into that. <clears throat> that means this mechanical, this is the mechanical systems. We can represent like that. And similarly, the equivalent of mechanical circuits can also be drawn. Here also, in fact, in mechanical systems, the equivalent electrical circuits can be drawn. Like once we can form this mechanical systems, then by replacing the 
damper in the resistance spring with capacitance mass with inductance and force with electromotive force we can jolly well develop the electrical circuits and we can analyze that and from that we can find the solutions so mass spring system by direct analogy so we can calculate the mobility which is mechanical admittance equivalent to electrical admittance so usual representations are dependent on the available measurement facilities so in fact our basic idea is to make the mechanical circuit so any mechanical system whatever complex it is this can be described by this mass being dashper as a basic elements and we can make the mechanical circuit just like the electrical circuits and using this since we have laplace transforms easily you can transform it to algebraic domain so the idea behind laplace transform is to solve differential equations in a simpler fashion we have already mentioned that in many engineering problems especially in mechanical and electrical engineering nature of differential equations are same we find that complex differential equations in fluid dynamics or in structural or in electron dynamics so in translating these problems to electrical circuits will help solving the problems since electrical circuit analysis using network analysis is well established area converting the electrical circuits to signal program will further simplify the process okay thank you thank you sir uh, thank you for sharing your ideas on laplace transformation uh, now uh, you uh, you mainly discussed on what is the main important topics on laplace transformation in very short time so and you uh, actually we all know that sometimes it is very difficult to us to solve some differential equation uh, it's very hard so laplace transformation is help us to solve this easily uh, any ordinary differential equation as well as our partial differential equation and you also discuss the important applications like uh, in engineering mathematics Uh, actually in uh, electronic circuits vibration analysis uh, process control etc this is very important application for many engineering students now and also you mention some important special type of function like impulse function dirac delta function etc so thank you and thank you share for your ideas now we shall take few minutes for discussion some questions from our participants i am requesting dr shankar prashad mondol sir to start the question answer session sir please sir actually uh, i have a question that is the what is the benefit for taking the laplace transformation just like is for the simple linear ordinary differential equation in fact i have already you know, discussed that the so, whole idea is to make the different equation simpler because you no know, by taking laplace transforms we are trans transforming the domain from time domain to frequency domain s domain so here in fact is totally algebraic form 
and algebraic solutions are much easier to handle. So that's the reason, in fact, Laplace transform uh, can solve the equations in an easier fashion. For an example, if we just follow the classical method for solving the differential equations, we have two parts, okay? Now, these two parts, we the electrical engineers or mechanical engineers, we say one is the transient, another is the steady, okay? Now, transient part is that part where the function is multiplied by e to the power minus kt, where k is a positive number. Another is, in fact, uh, is a steady part. So any function when it's multiplied by uh, this exponential function, that means it's a decaying function. So both these things will be there. Mathematicians, in fact, they give the different name. Okay. And this, uh, now here, when you take the Laplace transforms, you must have noticed that A is equal to sigma plus j omega. Okay. Now, sigma plus j omega, it will be minus st when it's multiplied by that. That means both the part will be available after solutions, but in a much more easier fashion. That's the whole idea. But Fourier transforms, in fact, it doesn't deal with the transient part. It deals only with the steady state part. Okay. Thank, thank you, sir. And another question from my side, that is, uh, how can we solve the integral differential equation in for the nonlinear cases? It is possible. In fact, by the, in, in fact, Lapl not, not Laplace transform is not meant for the nonlinear differential equations. Okay. Okay. Because in, in electrical circuits, mechanical systems, these are linear. So we deal with the linear systems. Okay. So for linear problem only, we can solve using the Laplace transform. Yeah. But in fact, nonlinear non systems, here also we can use it. But then we have to consider this nonlinear, you know, piecewise linear. If we can make it a piecewise linear, then we can take Laplace transforms for that. Let's say, uh, from T1 to T2, it is following a particular law. From T2 to T3, something. So we have to do from T1 to T2 separately, T2 to T3 separately in that way. Uh, uh, it is uh, the delay differential equation is also solvable by Laplace transform? Normally, in fact, partial differential equations are not solvable by uh, Laplace transforms. So for only the linear differential equation is solved using the Laplace transform. Yeah, ordinary no. linear okay. differential equations. Okay. We'll one question. That. One question is: What is the relation between Laplace and Fourier? Can you? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Now, if we take the Fourier transforms, then f omega or f j omega equal to integration of f t to the minus j omega t dt. Whereas for Laplace, f s equal to integration of f t e to the minus s t, then d t. Now, s equal to sigma plus j omega. Now, if sigma equal to 0, it becomes what? Okay. If sigma equal to 0, it becomes e to the minus j omega d d t. Isn't oh. Well, But there is another difference. For Fourier transforms, the limit of integration is from minus infinity to plus infinity. But here, for Laplace, it is 0 to infinity. So these are the two basic differences. So if we take, uh, let's say, to understand it, let's take the example of uh, this impulse function. Impulse function del t equal to 1 for t equal to 0. For t equal, at t equal to 0, it is infinite, and del t dt equal to 1. For this function, you will find uh, Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms gives the same results, 1. Why? Because it doesn't have any value uh, at minus zero or at t equal to zero minus. So in the negative sides, it doesn't have anything, any contents. So that's why s equal to sigma plus j omega. If sigma equal to zero, then it becomes j omega. And then Laplace and Fourier, they are same, provided it is from minus infinity to plus infinity, it is from zero to infinity. Okay. okay. And Fourier transform deals only with the steady steady state part, not with the transient part. Okay, sir. Uh, one participant is asked, 
And yes, sir, uh, is there any relation between Laplace transform and Maxwell equation? No, no, these are different. Okay. Uh, I have another question that uh, the Laplace transform is uh, is not new in the research domain now. So how can we use the Laplace transform in present day research? Sorry, in present day, in present time research. Yeah, present like modern fact, research. Yeah, Laplace transform in fact is uh, widely used, you know, in mm -hmm. engineering solutions where you see the linear characteristics, linear systems, and in reality, most of the systems are, uh, in fact, many of, many systems are uh, linear systems. So for linear systems, we apply that. Because mm -hmm. when we are dealing with the uh, differential equations, nth order differential equations, that is very difficult to solve using your classical uh, technique to solve it. So yeah, Laplace transform is very, very essential, very, very helpful. Another question is like that, if you take a function of small f of t, this is defined in the time domain. Na? And if you take the Laplace transform of the function, then it goes to capital letter f of s. This is a space domain. Yeah, capital F s. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what is the basic uh, thing that is time domain and space domain? Can you give a simple example? OK, I'm, I'm telling Time domain, you take a sin sinusoidal signal, OK? Now, a sinusoidal signal, if you write ft equal to sine of omega t. Now, ft equal to sine of omega t is a sine function, and frequency omega equal to twice pi f. If small f is the frequency, omega equal to twice pi f. Now, this sine function, if you see in the time domain, what is the amplitude? Amplitude is one peak value of the amplitude, because sine functions will keep on increasing. Then after that, it will start falling. And what is the maximum value? Maximum value here is, since it is sine of omega t, that means one into sine omega t. So one is the maximum, when pi equal to 90 degree, that time it will reach the peak value, that is one, okay? That is for the okay. sine functions, you understand. And what is the frequency? The frequency is small f, and small f equal to one by t. Now here is the, in terms of time you can see, and you can see the total time period. When you take Fourier transforms, what you will see? If you take the Fourier transforms, you will see only one value. And your x-axis will be replaced by omega. Omega is the frequency and y-axis is the amplitude. That means you will see the in the frequency domain or for Laplace also the same thing. Frequency domain means your axis will be for this particular frequency, what is the amplitude? In time domain, at this particular time, what was the value? Is okay. 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 Sir. Mm, another question is from a participant that can we use Laplace transform to solve difference differential equation? I think he says uh, difference and differential equation Look, means yeah. maybe Dif dif yeah. difference equation simple hmm. or differential or difference no. equation both together. No. No. For difference equation, difference first a signal or a function has to be discretized, okay? Yes, sir. This is for the discrete, and there we use the Z transforms. Achha. Laplace transform is for the continuous signals, FT, and discrete signals are we call FN. Okay, a continuous signal by sampling is converted to discrete signals. Okay, discrete signals like after a uh, capital T unit of time, capital T is called the sampling period. Let's say now uh, FT, is a function of time, then this will be n, fn. fn means n equal to 0, 1, 2, 3 in that. Order. So you will get the discrete value. For discrete value, you need different equations. And for different equations, we normally use z transforms, okay, which is the discrete versions of Laplace, you can say. Anyway, so Laplace transform is applicable for continuous signal only, for continuous functions only. So different equations cannot be applied for Laplace transform. Different equation will be used only for the discrete. Okay, because differential equation uh, are comes from the continuous system modeling. So yeah. for that purpose, we use the Take Laplace transform. Uh, Laplace transform, and yeah. for the difference equation, that is the discrete system modeling, we use yeah. that G transform. Yeah, so G transform. There is a so continuous system has to be converted to that. 
the continuous system should be converted to discrete systems and then you can go for different equations okay so i have another uh, question that suppose a, a model is like that a non linear model then after some transformation we can transform the model into linear one then it can be solvable na yeah like you know what you have to do a non linear system will have to be made piecewise linear okay and within that period you have to do so uh, there exist different types of software uh, softwares of some programming language maybe software like that matlab can we solve uh, uh, some problem using laplace transform yes, using yes, matlab yes we can we, we do that in fact we the engineers especially the electrical okay. engineers we do that so if there is some non linear function then it it is solvable or not in matlab in fact in matlab what we uh, do that you know they are in fact uh, these are not applicable but this can be done you know in fact i was doing some research on that also uh, okay this this can be done okay so i think i have an observation that matlab uh, transform the non linear function into a linear function okay. that type of thing or not no non linear look you know it's not the question of matlab or anything matlab is a tool you know okay okay let's in general if we discuss okay. from the mathematical point of view okay. then any non linear system non linear means what you know it doesn't follow the linearity now if any non linear system if it can be broken piecewise into some linear within a range then we can deal with that range hello for your lecture anisha please anisha hello 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 ha ha please okay thank you sir thank you very much uh, if anyone from the participants have any question about uh, any topic about laplace transformation so you may drop your question our discussion forum and we convey your question to our speakers thank you thank you sir thank you next thank you uh next move on to our next uh, topic uh our next speaker that is uh, professor shamarjit kaur from mathematics department of nit durgapur his area of research are operation research uh, so computing fuzzy mathematics uh, fuzzy mathematics he has almost 75 publications in various reported national and international journals today his title of lecture is fuzzy optimization and discussion making uh, professor shobhajit kaur sir please हेलो शंभु सर हेलो मैडम वी रिक्वेस्ट ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट टू वेट फ्यू मिनट्स आवर सेकंड स्पीकर विल जॉइन वेरी सुन 
please pardon for the inconvenience uh, if there is any more questions related to the first um, first topic then we can discuss it uh, if uh, amit sinha sir is there we can uh, continue the question answer session okay is... okay sir may i ask you a question yes sinha sir yes uh, sir yes please uh, actually you told that that uh, using laplace transformation we can uh, you solve Uh, Nonlinear differential equations. Maybe uh, if we uh, make this uh, parti uh, partially uh, linear form, then we can solve this. But if we can't uh, make this in a partial linear forms, then uh, is there any other uh, transform that helps to solve nonlinear differential equations? No. In fact, look, you know, any nonlinear system, you no know, differential equation comes from the system. System behavior, in fact, will be model. With the differential equations, so for any nonlinear systems, if we claim any kind of differential equations, then what you have to do, you know, we have to make it piecewise linear. For an example, just I'm giving a small example. Let's say you consider a straight line. Let's say up to some time, its gradient is something. After a particular point, the gradient is getting changed. After that, the slope is changing. Then what you can do within that particular time period? it can be considered as linear or let's say a parabola within a particular period or time it is behaving like a parabola function after that it is behaving like another functions so that means within that range we can make it a linear so the behavior of the system can be modeled as linear within a particular time and within that range we can take the laplace transform and we can solve thank you sir sir i have a hello sir i have a question hmm um this i i was just curious to ask you that uh, you know that um, uh, laplace transform can be used to Uh, solve for uh, ordinary differential equations as as well as partial differential equations so no. particular in fact for partial differential we use only for ordinary differential equations normally for partial differential equation laplace transforms are not used no that can be uh, yes sir it can be done uh, you can convert the partial differential equation by some uh, by yeah, giving yeah. the transformation to a ordinary differential equation yeah, that is the yeah. then you can solve it yeah, yeah. that's true Uh, so uh, in that context uh, since wave equations are um, sometimes are uh, non linear so in that context we can say that laplace transform can be used uh, for solving non linear differential equations yeah in fact as i told you know earlier also i told partial differential equation and non linear these two things are totally different you know okay when we talk about non linear differential equations then we have to consider the total non linear system into piece wise linear and within that linearity we can take the laplace transforms for an example from t1 to t2 it behaves like that so we have to find out the solutions from t1 to t2 from t2 to t3 if it behaves differently solution will be different but within that period its behavior has to be linear okay okay sir yeah um... suppose sir um, say sir uh, for example uh, say sir uh, what diffusion equation this is a partial differential equation right and suppose it's a um, uh, initial value problem and mm -hmm. the initial value is in terms of some non linear function suppose uh, u at at some x and t is equal to 0 is equal to some uh, some trigonometric function say sin uh, sin alpha x say mm -hmm. then the equation becomes a non linear equation because it involves some um, uh, sin uh, trigonometric function then uh, it's then is the equation no, the trigonometric function doesn't make a system uh, uh, non linear equations 
there is no reasons to think that if trigonometric function is there, the function becomes uh, okay. Right, right, right. You are right, uh, but there may be some term um, uh, of degree more than one, right? Which will be coupled with uh, uh, the dependent variable. For example, if, um, for example, sir, uh, so for this particular example, um, if you consider uh, this equation is like this, uh, uh, say dtu dx square plus. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, please carry on. Yeah. Yes, sir. For example, sir, the equation is like this. Uh, D2u dx square, the, after, uh, after uh, converting the partial differential equation to the to a different uh, ordinary differential equation giving the Laplace transform, it becomes a function like suppose dTU dx square where u is the Laplace transform of the um, main mm -hmm. dependent variable, right? So dTU yeah. dx square is, um, uh, is equal to the a square u x x is equal to some function of s. In that case, it becomes a nonlinear uh, ordinary differential equation. No, in fact, you know, look, you know, it's not that. If you see the Laplace transforms of various functions, there also you'll find uh, s to the power n divided by this, this kind of things are there. You just look at the table of Laplace transforms, you will find square or even in fact, uh, cube or many other in fact. S yes. to the power n is there and still we are doing the solutions, no problem. But uh, in that case, sir, uh, that a, uh, that dependent variable is not coupled with the main variable. Suppose uh, the form is not like that. Uh, say uh, y is the dependent variable and x is the independent variable. Okay. The form will be like that. Uh, say d two y dx square plus y is equal to if there is y to the power n, then this becomes a uh, then this, this is a uh, different no. can, can you write it down? Can you write it down and show it? I'll tell you. Can um, you write it down? Uh, in a piece of paper I and can, show it. Okay. I can message you, sir. Okay. I, I, I can tell you one thing. Look, if you take a partial differential equations, always this partial differential equation can be converted. Oh, okay. To, to an ordinary uh, differential equation. And we yeah, can solve right, it. Right. Hmm. That's not a problem. We can, we can always solve it hmm. by using Laplace transforms. Now, hmm. Laplace transforms, I'm telling you, once you get the algebraic form, then within that form, huh, whether power is n equal to 2 or 3 or 4, that doesn't yeah. matter. Once this power is there, then by partial fraction methods, we can we can combine it to a number of. And then we can take the Laplace transform. Yes, sir. Okay, so thank you, thank you. Okay. okay. Hello? Yes, sir. Welcome to our FDP program, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So I will um, request Anisha kindly to introduce uh, Professor Kaur once again. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, our second speaker is Professor Dr. Shomarjit Kaur from Mathematics Department of NIT Durgapur. His area of research are operational research, soft computing, fuzzy mathematics. He has almost 75 publications in various reported national and international journals. Today, his title of lecture is Fuzzy Optimization and Decision Making. Uh, thank you. Sorry, sorry sir. Uh, please, sir, uh, kindly deliver your speech. Hello. 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 Yeah. So. My screen is visible now. Hello? No, no sir. No, no, sir. Just a minute. That's all right. Right. Hang on. It 
Hello. Yes. Uh, my screen is visible now. No, no, no. No, sir, it's still still not visible. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. It is now visible. Okay. Okay. So, good afternoon to all of you. So, yes, first of all, first of all, I convey my sincere thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity, uh, especially uh, Dr. Mondal and Dr. Vishas. Uh, I'm really very happy to be here today for giving this lecture. So, my uh, today's topic is uh, fuzzy optimization and decision making. So. Uh, I think uh, here one thing is very important because three things, uh, one is uh, what is fuzzy sets, uh, what are the basics of this because maybe some of you have some idea about fuzzy sets and uh, fuzzy logic. And uh, second thing is why optimization is important for real life decision making problems. So actually uh, in, uh, different, in decision making problem uh, when we use some optimization tools and techniques so obviously uh, in real life situations there are many kinds of uncertainties and uh, impreciseness may happen so uh, uh, there are uh, two important theories nowadays people have uh, using for solving such type of decision making problem uh, one is probability theory and another is fuzzy set theory so uh, uh, pro in probability theory uh, maybe uh, we can use some uh, uh, distribution function so for uh, handling such type of uncertainties. And in fuzzy theory, we use uh, different kinds of membership functions for uh, representing those uh, imprecise variables uh, and uncertain variables. So uh, here uh, in this presentation, first I gave you some basic ideas about fuzzy sets and then why fuzzy, uh, why fuzzy decision making is important. What is the basic difference between deterministic decision making and fuzzy decision making? Then I, uh, I give you some ideas about different kinds of fuzzy optimization techniques, uh, maybe uh, elaborately expressed in a fuzzy linear programming problem. And then I give you some idea about fuzzy multiple, multiple criteria decision making or fuzzy MCDM techniques. And finally, I give uh, the uh, uh, real life examples and concludes this presentation. Okay, so why decision making is important. So. Uh, in decision making, maybe we can categorize the decision making uh, problems in three categories. One is decision making under certainty, decision making under risk, and decision making under uncertainty. So why? Uh, what is decision making under certainty? So obviously here, uh, the complete information is there. That means maybe I can give you one example here. Uh, determining which ingredients in what quantity to add a mixture uh, being made so that it will uh, specify its uh, it will specification on its compositions. So it's completely deterministic system, and we can uh, develop some uh, simple mathematical tool for uh, solving these type of problems. Maybe another kind of another kind of problem that is decision making under risk. So where uh, less than competitive info complete information. So as for example, maybe one can. Uh, invest his money in different portfolios, that means different shares, so that uh, he can uh, get the maximum return or maybe minimize his risk for the, that allocation of funds in different securities. So this is basically a portfolio optimization problem where we can use some probability distribution and maybe we can solve such type of problems using uh, stochastic optimization techniques. And another kind of decision making problem that is decision making under uncertainty. Obviously here less information is available. Say for example, uh, if the temperature is cold, uh, travel by a car. So here maybe some imprecision or uh, vagueness or uncertainty is involved. That can be tackled by some uh, 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 fuzzy optimization technique. Maybe I can give you in details in the later uh, presentation. So obviously the decision making always involves making a choice between various possible of alternatives. And we have to choose the, uh, the best possible one that is basically the called the optimal, optimal solution or maybe the optimal one. Okay, so 
in general, the decision making problem can be categorized into two uh, groups. So one is basically known as the discrete optimization uh, problems and another is called continuous optimization problem in the broad sense. So in discrete optimization problems, basically your decision space, that means where you want to solve your problem that is finite, uh, finite or finite discrete sets. Say for example, here you just look. So a teenage girl known for boys, all of whom she like, and has to decide whom among them to go steady with. So that means you have different four different four different alternatives. Out of those four different alternatives, uh, you should choose the best one. So obviously, maybe there are for for four for different alternatives, there are different criteria like how handsome the guy is, how uh, how tall, uh, whether he is intelligent, how much intelligent he is, and so on. So for different uh, criteria. Maybe we can use we can use some different score uh, so that we can uh, consider the total uh, score of each individual, and finally we can select which one is best. So that means uh, the best optimal solution. And in the second category of uh, problems, that maybe uh, here the decision space is not uh, finite. So in that case, maybe the decision space is infinite or maybe finitely very large. So in that case, maybe and the problem is called uh, continuous optimization problem. And sometimes there are some constraints. So maybe we can categorize this uh, uh, unconstrained and constant optimization problem. So maybe in decision making problem, we can solve the decision making problem by different optimization tools or optimization techniques. And that problems can be categorized in different ways, maybe discrete, continuous, maybe constant, unconstrained, and so on. So what is the steps for solving the decision-making problems? This is very important. For any real life decision-making problem, uh, what are the basic steps for solving those decision problems? So in the first steps, obviously we should define the problem in a proper manner with all relevant data and information on it. And maybe there are some controllable inputs. That means for any problems, when you collect some data or some inputs, in that inputs may be uh, controllable. That means that can be controlled. That may be precise, but there are some uncontrollable factors or uncontrollable un inputs that may be random or fuzzy variables. So accordingly, we can define our problem. And in the steps second, that is very important. According to those informations, first we have to uh, construct a mathematical model say we can say as an optimization model because here a mathematical model is basically an optimization problem. Uh, so that means we have to uh, prepare the objective functions and the constraints to represent the corresponding mathematical model, model as an optimization one. And in the next step, obviously the most important step, how to solve that mathematical problem or mathematical optimization problem. So obviously, we have to apply the most appropriate optimization techniques or algorithm for giving problems. So that means there are a number of optimization tools and techniques, maybe algorithms, but which one is most appropriate for solving your problem? It's because your problem is maybe in different types, maybe it's constant problem, maybe unconstant problem, maybe linear problem, maybe nonlinear problem, because any optimization problem may be categorized in different way. So, so obviously there are different classical methods, classical optimization methods by which we can solve the corresponding problem. So one of the important point is that you have to choose the appropriate uh, optimization technique or optimization tool by which you can actually solve your problem. And final step is implementation or validation of the solution because maybe you can use one algorithm for solving or optimization technique for solving your problem, but you get a solution that may not be acceptable by the decision maker. That means maybe your solution is not very appropriate for the real life situation. So in that case, maybe that means validation part is very important when you solve some real life decision making problem. So implementation is very, very important. So whether your solution is basically suitable for the actual decision making problem or not. If not, maybe you have to, uh, 
again uh, set your uh, uh, initial consideration or initial assumptions maybe change your initial assumptions and then construct your model uh, again and then you know, solve it and finally you have to validate it so this is the uh, steps for solving the decision making problem okay so now what is optimization that already i told you basically optimization is uh, art of uh, is a technique or art of uh, art of uh, obtaining the best possible best policies to satisfy certain objectives at the same time satisfy some constraints or requirements so this is the actual definition of an optimization problem optimization so in general optimization can be classified by unconstrained optimization or constrained optimization maybe uh, here i just give you a very simple example say maximize a function so obviously uh, this is a uh, non linear function but uh, this function can be solved by some classical that means calculus based approach and solution is given here and in the other case maybe there is a constant optimization problem here design a box with maximum volume and minimum surface area so obviously here our objective is to maximize z that is z equal to xyz subject to the surface area that means 2 into xy plus yz plus zx less than equal to k so if we solve this problem by classical technique so the solution is x equal to y equal to z so this is a very simple engineering problem and maybe there are several kinds of engineering problems by which we can solve maybe some numerical techniques through optimization uh, techniques so this is the basic things of optimization now because uh, my uh, uh, today's presentation is basically on fuzzy optimization so uh, before going to the fuzzy optimization model Uh, first i want to define uh, the basic things of fuzzy set theory maybe some of other presentations have some i some of the uh, participants have some knowledge about fuzzy set i just quickly go through it so what is fuzzy set theory so actually in uh, already i told you the most uh, in optimization there are most uh, important uncertainty based optimization techniques are stochastic optimization technique and another is fuzzy optimization technique so uh already i uh, told you so in stochastic optimization technique basically uh, people have used some uh, probability distribution to uh, uh, representing the uh, coefficients or constraints uh, uh, by some probability distribution uh, and in fuzzy theory the uh, the uncertain uh, uncertain parameters or uncertain constants are represented by uh, some uh, membership function okay uh, already i think all of you have some idea about fuzzy uh, distribution i uh, sorry probability distribution so now what is uh, fuzzy membership function because in classical set all of you know uh, there is uh, if, if for any any statement or any uh, belongingness of an element this, this is exact that means an element either belongs to a set or not belongs to a set in classical set theory but in fuzzy set theory and uh, the belongingness is partial partial means it may belongs to or that means belongs to the set with a certain degree that means belongingness is partial so the fuzzy set is defined in this way in the classical set the belongingness is represented by a function maybe that x uh, uh, maps to either 0 or 1 that means if the belongingness is uh, the element is belongs to the set then the corresponding characteristic value is 1 if the element not belongs to the set then its characteristic value is 0 but in case of fuzzy set theory it belongingness is partial so that means it is represented by a degree of degree of belongingness or degree of membership so that membership function is represented by mu ax such that x maps to 0 1 closed interval 0 1 that means the membership value is not exactly 0 or 1 it may be any value between 0 and 1 so obviously mu x is 1 means it totally belongs to x if mu x is 0 then it is not belongs to x and if lies between 0 and 1 then it is partial so 
this is the basic difference between classical set and fuzzy set so that means here the fuzzy set is basically represented by its membership function so for any element x in the universe capital x the membership functions equals to the degree to which x belongs to the set a the degree of value between 0 and 1 represent the degree of membership also called the membership value of the elements of x in the set a so already i told you how to differentiate these fuzziness and randomness because maybe you have some idea of probability theory actually maybe in a single sentence i can say in random theory or probability theory basically depends on chance and in fuzzy theory it depends of belongingness so one is depends on chance another is depends on its belongingness that means in fuzzy theory say suppose i just give you a very simple example here so suppose you have in 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 presence of you there there are two glass of liquid and say maybe one glass of liquid the probability distribution uh, probability uh, uh, probability value is 0.95 and another glass of liquid is a uh, probability of drinkability actually maybe you 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 may be a very thirsty person and in front of you there are two glass of liquid and drinkability of probability of drinkability of one glass of liquid is 0.95 and probability of drinkability of uh, fuzzy membership value is 0.95 we know what is fuzzy uh, probability value and what is fuzzy value now the point is which glass of liquid you choose uh, for your uh, drink so already i told you that both probability value and fuzzy value lies between 0 and 1 but fuzzy membership value is not equal to probability because already i told you probability value depends on chance or depends on frequency and fuzzy value is depends or based on similarity so this is the most important issue here one is depends on frequency one is depends on similarity so now the question is which glass of liquid you choose and for your drink so obviously the answer is fuzzy value why why fuzzy i just quickly describe it because conceptually you just look probability theory based on frequency so frequency means if we have 100 glass of liquid there are 90 glasses of liquid which are uh, absolutely drinkable that means those 100 glass of liquid is purity is purity is complete that means there is no impurity on those 95 glasses but other five glasses maybe 100% impurity is there maybe those glasses are full of methylated spirit so that means you have a 5% chance which is very very harmful to you if we drink that glass of liquid so that means in probability theory there are 95 glasses which is 100% 100% drinkable liquid and there are five glass of liquid which are 100% not drinkable and another case because fuzzy based on similarity that means if we choose all if we choose any one of all 100 glasses all are similar that means all the 100 glasses there may be 5% impurity is there 95% purity is there only 5% impurity is there that means if we choose any one of those 100 glass of liquid that is not very much harmful to you only 5% impurity is there because all of you know in our uh, country maybe each and every product there are maybe in uh, that is most of the products available in the market there are some impurity but maybe uh, we in been born we accept it so that is the basic difference between fuzzy versus probability fuzzy is depends on similarity probability is depends on frequency that means out of 100 glass of liquid there are five glass of liquid which are 100% impurity 
But in the case of fuzzy fury, if we choose any one of those hundred glass of liquid, all belongs to the all have ninety five percent purity, only five percent impurity. So this is the basic thing. How fuzziness differs from the randomness. So that means according to your problem, that means decision makers' problem, you can clearly classify. So where you choose the probabilistic approach, where you choose the fuzzy based approach. When for so when you go for solving any decision making problem. Okay, so maybe uh, I quickly go through this part. Uh, what is the set theoretic concept for fuzzy uh, fuzzy logic or fuzzy sets? So in set theoretic concept, it is uh, we can develop the similar set theoretic operations like complement, intersection, and union for fuzzy sets. Say if we consider the containment. So obviously the A is contained in B. So that is in the uh, left figure. You just look. So A is contained in B because it is represented by the corresponding membership functions. If we compare the yellow curve and the uh, pink curve, so obviously look, the yellow curve is uh, entirely contained uh, in B. Uh, that means that pink curve. So obviously A contained in B. But uh, when we consider the complement, it may be the figure B you look, that means if we consider a fuzzy set A that is represented by yellow line in the first curve, because here we consider two fuzzy sets A and B that are represented by two membership function. One membership function is represented by that yellow curve, another uh, represented by the pink curve. So obviously, if we consider the complement of A that is represented by A bar or maybe AC. So obviously the corresponding uh, membership function is represented by this. Why? Because mathematically you just look mu of AC x, this is equal to one minus mu AX. That means if we consider any point on this X axis, that means if we consider the corresponding height of that uh, function, that means the corresponding mu value, Obviously, in A complement, the mu value is one minus of that. So obviously, the corresponding graphical representation is represented by this curve. Okay. So similarly, if we consider the union, union is represented by that max function. So that means max of mu ax and mu vx. So obviously, if we the graphical representation is uh, this represented by that yellow curve. So because uh, we consider, if we consider any point. In the first figure, you look figure A. So that means uh, before the point, before the point they join, all the points in the yellow curve is greater than pink value. So obviously, before uh, before the point X where these two curves meet, all the values are follow the yellow line, and after the point where they meet, they follow the pink line. So obviously the A intersection B curve, sorry, A union B curve is represented by the corresponding membership function that is represented in graph C. Similarly for the uh, intersection curve, so obviously A intersection B is represented by the corresponding figure four, because here we consider the mean, mean of mu A and mu B. So that is represented by the corresponding curve because we consider the mean function. So now, when we uh, consider any real life decision making problem, so the uh, the uh, we consider some parameters or some constants that has there are some parameters or some constants that are represented by some linguistic variables or linguistics equations. So in that case, uh, so how to represent? those uh, qualitative representation qualitative representation because uh, in general obviously the most important issue is in real life situations some when we consider some real life problem there are some uh, data or some informations that are quantitative some are qualitative so how those qualitative informations or qualitative variables represent so those qualitative variable can be represented by some linguistic terms. So those that's are basically called the linguistic variables. So what is the definition of linguistic variable? 
linguistic variable is a variable whose values are words or sentences a nature of artificial language so in in general uh, some of you have some idea about artificial intelligence and so on so when we say some artificial language or qualitative language then maybe we can say it at is a, a linguistic variable say for example say if we consider the age uh, mostly we use when we say the age of a person and we use hey, maybe young maybe middle age maybe old age like this so how to represent that by using some fuzzy membership function so obviously in the graph if we consider the ages of a person in the x axis it may be 0 25 40 55 and so on so that representation may be represented by fuzzy terms by using some membership function maybe those persons who are less than 25 ages they are really young but between 25 to 40 they looks sometimes some man may be around 40 ages but he looks very young but though he looks very young but not he is not very young so obviously that representation that means his membership is gradually diminishing with the age that means from 25 to 40 maybe we can say 0 to 25 he is really young but 25 to 40 maybe is young with some diminishing membership value and maybe from 25 to 55 maybe we consider as a middle age that means if we consider 25 to 40 he is middle with gradually increasing membership value and maybe 40 to 55 he is gradually decreasing so actually at the age of 40 he may be the real middle age so that that's why its membership value is one so similarly for old so a graphical representation this is basically a graphical representation of a linguistic value and obviously we can easily determine the corresponding mathematical membership function for this because we can easily mathematically determine the corresponding uh, equation of those lines so such that we can represent the corresponding functional values so but when we Uh, use those linguistic terms in some decision making problems that may be represented in some rules or maybe in some equations it may be in any form so if we represent it in a rule so that rule can be represented in some form of equations maybe later on but how the rule is like looks like so the rule is like this if the temperature is cold and oil is cheap then heating time is high so obviously you just look here we use three different linguistic values what is their linguistic values what are the linguistic variables temperature oil heating these are some linguistic variable like in the previous example you just look age is a linguistic variable but that age can be represented by different words or different uh uh, uh terms like young middle old so these are basically called linguistic term so any linguistic variable temperature can be represented by different linguistic terms maybe temperature is cold maybe temperature is hot maybe temperature is warm maybe temperature is very very cold like this similarly the oil is also another linguistic variable that also represented by different linguistic terms oil is cheap oil oil is oil price is high and so on similarly heating time is high heating time is less heating time is moderate so we can use different linguistic variables with different linguistic term so that means we can represent a decision when we represent a decision making systems in that decision making systems may be different type of rules or different type of uh, equation involved that can be represented by some qualitative variable or linguistic variable with different linguistic term so that is mathematically how it is mathematically expressed now so obviously it is uh, represented in this form linguistic variable is represented in linguistic value so this is linguistic value are uh, represented by cold cheap and and so on so obviously that is represented by some membership function that is mu cold mu chief and mu high 
So now we can use some fuzzy if and then rule. So what is the concept of fuzzy if and then? Sonai, I'm a disturb. So that implication rule, uh, if X is A, then Y is B. So obviously that is represented by some, and I just quickly go through this part because uh, in fuzzy reasoning part is very important. So how to represent those reasoning? So obviously that reasoning may be represented uh, this way. Maybe there is a rule. That rule is if X is A, then Y is B. So obviously the fact is X is A dashed. So like this, if temperature is high, then we can uh, uh, increase the speed of a fan. So one is the uh, temperature, another is a speed uh, of a fan. So obviously these two linguistic term, and obviously one new fact comes, maybe temperature is moderate, then what is your uh, conclusion? So in this way, we can generate a rule and for a new fact, what should be the conclusion? This is basically called the fuzzy reasoning. So obviously from these two, we can generate new, the value of y. Say, so obviously, how to represent that? There is a very important technique that is called fuzzy max mean composition. So in fuzzy max mean compositions, we can represent it. First, we take the mean of these two, because you just look, the first rule can be represented by a joint membership function of x and y that is represented by mu r x comma y. And uh, the fact is represented by uh, mu x y, uh, sorry, mu x. So obviously if we consider the mean of these two, that means mu a dash because the new fact x is a dash. So obviously that is represented by mu a dash x. Uh, intersection mu r x y. Net a problem. Uh, so, what is the conclusion here? So, conclusion is y is b dash. So, we compose. Maybe there is a single rule. Maybe there is a set of rules. So, we can also compose a set of rules so that we can conclude y is b dash. So, for the first case, graphically we can represent it. You just look. A is represented by some membership that is represented by this blue card. And B is another membership that is represented in the right-hand side card. And maybe one new fact comes that is represented by a membership that is A dashed. So obviously we can easily represent that intersection of A and A dashed from this card and we can generate the corresponding value. So that is uh, graphically also we can look. So we just look because this is the intersection and we can easily represent this, uh, that the corresponding value. So that means here we can represent the corresponding area. So from that area, we can easily represent the corresponding membership of B dash. So this is the mathematical thing as well as uh, graphical things. We can uh, completely represent it in this way. So this part is very important because when we consider any real life decision making problem, so how to represent some rules or some equations mathematically using some membership functions of fuzzy set theory or fuzzy variables, then how to compose those rules? And when a new rule fire, when a new fuzzy sets fire, so how to uh, uh, conclude it? So there are different composition rules, maybe max mean, because in the previous case, I you just look, we use the max mean rule. Obviously there are max product, mean max, max mass, difference rules is there. Uh, maybe here also we can give one discrete type of examples, say for X is A, then Y is B. So A is represented by only, you just look for the set A only, uh, three uh, three values are there, one, two, three, with the membership value 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.7. And in the case of fuzzy set B, there is uh, five, seven, and nine with the membership value 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and 0.4. So if we infer a new fuzzy set, if we want to infer a new fuzzy set B from the another rule, X is Z S, then Y is B S, where Z S is given, that means Z S is the another fuzzy set with uh, three points, one, two, and three uh, with membership values 0 0.5, 0 0.9, and 0 0.3. Then obviously you just look from A and B, if we consider the mean product, 
uh, sorry, uh, mean of these values, that means mean function, that means we can represent the corresponding relational, uh, re relational fuzzy set are by meaning, my, by considering the mean of, you just look, 0.2 and 0.6 minimum is 0.2, 0.2 and 0.5 minimum is 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 minimum is 0.2, so you get the fast flow. Similarly, 0 0.5 and 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.7 and 0.5, if, uh, 0.5 and 0 0.4, 0 0.4. So you get second row. In this way, we can generate the corresponding relation uh, R. And then we consider the max mean product. That means we consider the uh, row of edest and first column of R. So, and take the maximum 0.5, uh, uh, point, uh, take the minimum 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.9, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. So obviously, uh, point, uh, uh, point 0.5 is maximum, so you get point 0.5. So it's very simple calculations. So by using this max mean composition, you can easily represent BDS. So we can use the similar techniques in optimization also. So obviously for any decision-making problem, what are the basic steps when you develop some fuzzy systems or fuzzy expert systems? So because fuzzy experts is, because in fuzzy theory, there are two important techniques. One is fuzzy, system, another is fuzzy decision model. So in fuzzy expert system, in fuzzy decision model, both are parallel, but conceptually little difference is there. So because when you develop a system, then obviously in the system you have some, obviously in system also you want to develop some model. And in fuzzy optimization also you want to develop some model. Everywhere, in both cases, there are some uh, uh, deterministic inputs, some qualitative inputs. So according to that qualitative input, you have to fuzzify those techniques, uh, fuzzify those variables, because maybe you have some qualitative uh, variable, but how to quantify it? That means quantification is one of the important part. That means how to represent the corresponding membership function. So that's why, Initially, you have some deterministic input. So from that deterministic input, you have a fuzzy interface. That means using that fuzzy interface, you, you represent those the deterministic input into fuzzy input. Then you have some inference engine. That means in that inference engine, you input those fuzzy things and you can generate some fuzzy rule base in the, uh, what is fuzzy rule that already I described. So once those rules are determined and then aggregate all those rules and we can generate some fuzzy output. But in general, in any machine or any decision maker cannot accept your fuzzy output. So another important step that is defuzzification step. So in defuzzification step, you defuzzify that fuzzy output and finally you can generate the creeps output. Okay, so now, Already I told you what is the fuzzification. Fuzzification is basically representation of some membership function. That membership function may be in triangular form. Mathematically, a triangular fuzzy membership function is represented by this way. Similarly, what is the inference? Inference means you can generate some rules and maybe there are R set of rules, R1, uh, R2 to RR, R set of rules, and you can aggregate those rules and maybe I generate a new fuzzy rule and that fuzzy rule is aggregated and you can defuzzify finally and you can get the output. Okay, so this is the concept of fuzzy expert system and in similar way, we can define the fuzzy decision making also. So what is fuzzy decision making? So in fuzzy decision making, uh, the conventional decision making model, your all the inputs are in deterministic form but in fuzzy decision making, your some of the inputs may be in fuzzy form or maybe in qualitative form that can be represented by some fuzzy membership function. And if the system is fuzzy, then optimization problem needs to revise it in a fuzzy environment or as a fuzzy, uh, fuzzy domain. In fuzzy system, the objective functions and constraints, because already I told you any optimization problems, maybe there are some uh, on, uh, for some objectives as well as some constraints. So those objective functions and constraint functions are characterized by some membership functions. 
the decision is the intersection of fuzzy constraints and fuzzy objectives that is important you just remember in the previous slides i said uh, two three slides before i saw you basically when you consider some mean concept that means we take basically the intersection of two fuzzy sets so here the constraints are represented by some fuzzy membership function and the objectives are represented by some membership function so obviously our target is to uh, intersect those constraints and objectives so basically bellman jade first introduced the basic concept of fuzzy goal fuzzy constraint and fuzzy decision in decision making so what is the concept of uh, fuzzy goal and fuzzy constraints so the fuzzy goal is um, represented by the membership function mu g that is from x to 0 1 and the constraints are represented by the membership that is mu c from x to 0 1 uh, obviously to be satisfied simultaneously both goal and constraints that gives you the corresponding decision so obviously the decision set is also another fuzzy set that is represented by g intersection c and that is characterized by the corresponding membership function mu gx that is mean of mu g i am sorry here there is a typo mu g and mu c x belongs to capital x so by the same way of the previous one so maximize ma maximizing the decision that is uh, max of x belongs to capital x mu dx that is <coughs> max of mean mu g and mu c so you just look graphically if we consider the the constraint membership function is represented by that mu c curve and the decision membership function is represented by mu d curve so obviously their intersection is represented by the corresponding bold curve so in this bold curve basically basically you just look if you consider the maximum point because for what value of x you get the maximum mu d so obviously that crossing of that point where mu c and mu d intersect that top of that crossing point basically gives you the the corresponding x that means where that the that line meet at x axis in between 20 and 30 that point gives you the optimum result here so this is the most important slide so this is the very basic concept of decision making that is given by bellman and jare so that means you have a constraint and you have a decision members that is represented both are maybe qualitative in nature so that two are represented by the membership function mu g and mu c and maybe graphically that is represented by two curves mu c is represented by the these curves and mu d is represented by that curve and if we take the intersection basically you get mu d at that is that that bold curve and finally taking the maximum that maximum gives you the corresponding deterministic output that means that corresponding x value that is lies between 20 and 30 so in a similar fashion you just look if your problem has a number of objective a number of constants not a single objective problem that may be multi objective problem as well as multiple constants are there so how to represent the corresponding uh, fuzzy problem now so obviously your decision is represented by the intersection of the k number of objectives as well as m number of constraints c1 c2 cm and the corresponding maximizing decision is defined as obviously mu dx that that x belongs to capital x that is max x belongs to capital x mean of mu g1 mu g2 and mu k1 as well as mu c1 mu c2 mu cm so obviously we get an aggregation the same thing you just look when we consider the expert system there are a set of rules that rules are represented by some fuzzy functions and we consider the aggregation of those rules there here also we we get the aggregations of those constraints and object objective goals and take their mean and finally we take the maximum to get the decision and this is also given by bellman and jade this is one uh, method for solving 
uh, fuzzy decision. Bellman and Jade also define some other technique that is additive model and sometimes it is product uh, model also. In the additive model, you just look, in the previous case, you just look, we consider the max mean for the mu d, but here we consider the mu d is uh, alpha i sum of alpha i mu g i plus beta j mu c j. So that means we, we consider some weight vectors. That means alpha i are the weights of the corresponding goals and beta j's are the weights of the corresponding constraint goals. And we aggregate all those uh, goals which are from objectives as well as constraints such that sum of alpha i plus sum of beta j, this is equal to one. So that is, it is called weighted average and weighted average or additive weighted average basically. So this is another way we can determine the corresponding mu d. Similarly, there is another alternative definition of fuzzy decision that is basically the product. So this product is represented by the product of all the objective memberships as well as product of all the constraint membership that is represented by mu d. So this is another kind of decision function. So maybe people define that final decision functions by different way that maybe by using max, max mean composition, that is maybe by max product composition, that may be the uh, arithmetic average, that may be geometric average, that means product average and so on. So you just look that these two objectives, that means once you get the additive, additive weight and maybe uh, additive technique, maybe productive technique, that the membership value always lies between the uh, that max mean product. This inequality is very important. That means the productive result is always less than the max mean result and that is also less than equal to the additive result. So this inequality always true if we consider any decision making problem and you can easily verify it uh, by uh, some simple linear programming model also. So graphically here, I just uh, give you a very simple function. So you just look once that, that previous functions I show you in the, my previous slide, that mu g in mathematical form is like this, zero if x less than equal to if x is greater than or equal to 30 uh, and one minus of this, if it is, uh, uh, sorry, in mu c actually, it is greater than or equal to 30, then it is zero. And uh, zero to 30, it is one plus x into x minus 30 whole to the power minus two whole to the power minus one. But it's maybe mathematical form is anything, but graphically you can easily uh, recognize, you can, I think so. That means mu c is represented by this diminishing curve from zero to 30 and uh, mu g is basically, this is exponential curve from 10 to uh, greater values. So you just look, if we consider the max mean compositions, we get the that middle bold curve that already I saw, uh, that I saw you in the previous slide. And if we, if we, uh, uh, if we apply the product rule for these two functions, you can generate this lower curve and if you uh, apply the uh, arithmetic uh, uh, average, so then you get the upper bold curve. So obviously from the graphical representation, it is very clear. So mu d in between mu d pr and mu d co. So that is the thing. Okay, so what is the basic structure of fuzzy decision making that is also very similar to the fuzzy expert system that I already told you. So when you have any decision-making concept that can be extended because maybe there are some uh, variable which are in qualitative form that is that are represented by some linguistic variable or maybe some fuzzy variable, we can extend that concept into fuzzy set by using some fuzzy membership function. Once that fuzzy sets are represents for different variables or different parameters, then maybe we can develop some fuzzy set theoretic operations like set theoretic operation means union, intersection, implement and others. Uh, we can use those uh, by using some composition rules or some fuzzy aggregation rules. Maybe that 
by some alpha cut, by some max mean rule, by some centroid methods. And then we aggregate those roles, uh, rules by some decision making approach, by, uh, by some aggregation method. And finally, we get a new fuzzy value or fuzzy output. And finally, we defugify it. Uh, by using some technique. Obviously, there are some defugification technique. I am not going to the detail of that part. And finally, we get the decision. Because now our task is, so how fuzzy decision making works? So obviously, in fuzzy decision making, there are different kinds of problems, or different uh, techniques also are important that may be categorized in different forms. Maybe the most easiest one is individual decision making. That means you have only one decision maker and the decision makers gives you the corresponding uh, qualitative variable by some membership function. And you uh, design that uh, optimization problem into fuzzy optimization problem mathematically. And you can solve uh, it by using some technique. And another is multi-person decision making problem. So obviously here, not a single decision maker involved maybe more than one decision maker involved. So that's why it is called multi-person decision making problem. And maybe there are different uh, decision makers. They, they represent their uh, fuzzy variable in different ways. Another is multi-criteria decision making problems. So that means you have different alternatives. Not a single solution exists. Maybe there are here in the previous case, maybe you want to buy a car and you may go for only one particular company, maybe Maruti or maybe, but in the case of multi-criteria decision-making problems, you have different alternatives as well as different criteria. So that means you may buy a Maruti car or you may buy a Hyundai car. So that means you have different alternatives as well as different criteria. All the, you have different criteria means maybe price, maybe color, maybe mileage, maybe comfort. So different criteria are also involved. So that is called multi-criteria decision-making problem. Another is multi-stage decision-making problem. Maybe some of you have some idea about multi-stage decision problem in deterministic system. We may solve such type of multi-stage decision-making problem by dynamic programming problem. Some of you have some idea of dynamic programming. So here also fuzzy dynamic programming is there. That is basically called multi-stage decision-making problem. And another category of problems where we can use some ranking method, because one more important thing, when we consider some deterministic problem, in deterministic problem is little easier. Why? Because you can compare any two solutions. That means for optimization problem, deterministic optimization problem, your solutions are always comparable. That means one solution is better than other, you can easily compare. That means there is a complete ordering between the solutions. But in fuzzy decision making, there is no complete ordering between the solutions. We Sometimes we can say the solution is little better than this, not always better. Maybe there are some cases other solution is better. But most of the cases, this solution is better. So that's why we can consider it. So that is because it is a qualitative judgment. So that's why we can rank them. So there are some fuzzy ranking methods, fuzzy ranking techniques. So that's why uh, one kind of fuzzy decision-making problem also called fuzzy ranking decision, fuzzy ranking techniques by which we can differentiate it. So these are some categorization of fuzzy decision-making problems. So what is individual decision-making problem? Maybe I can give you a very simple example. That example, you just look, a company wants to fill a position and there are five candidates, X1 to X5, who from the set of alternatives, and there are six alternatives, X1 to X6, hiring uh, the committee has three objective goals. What are the objective goals? Experience, computer skill, and young age. So these, these are the three important objectives they have considered. And obviously the committee has one constraint. The salary offers would be modest. That means they are not giving a good amount of salary, maybe average amount of salary like this. 
so according to those goals and constraints because you have three goals experience computer skill young age and the constraint the decision maker because only one decision maker is there that means one interview uh, 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 expert is there so that expert represent those according to those uh, five uh, individuals x1 to x5 their membership function is represented by this that means for goal one according to experience x1 is very experienced person so that's why he gets 0.8 x2 is not that x much experience so he get 0.6 x3 has very less experience so that's why his membership value is 0.3 x4 is also a good experience so that is 0.7 x5 is also little amount of experience so that is 0.5 so in this way the goal one is defined similarly for computer skill similarly for young age the goals are defined similarly the constraint is also defined according to the salary because different alternative that means different member wants different kinds of salary x1 is may be happy with uh, average salary but x2 wants little more salary and so on x5 is very higher salary is required for x5 so that means now the decision making process so which candidate will be selected for the job the question is this so obviously by the simple mathematical model because it is represented given by the bellman and jade so d is intersection of g1 g2 g3 and g c3 so if we take the intersection that means you just look in the first row intersection means minimum so if we consider all the values of x1 0.8 0.7 0.7 and 0.4 you look 0.4 is minimum so for x1 the corresponding membership value is 0.4 similarly for x2 we consider the minimum in the second row we just look 0.6 is minimum similarly for x3 0.3 is minimum similarly for x4 0.2 is minimum similarly for x5 0.3 is minimum so we we consider that d set so that means d set with the membership values are 0 0.4 0 0.6 0 0.3 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 so now which one is best out of those five so that means which one because initially we consider minima then take the maxima so out of those five membership values which gives you the maximum membership value x2 gives you the maximum membership value so that means the x2 that means the second person will be selected for the job clear so this is a very simple decision making problem and it is basically in the category of individual decision making so obviously there is another examples because the shortage of time maybe i can skip this uh, slide because i have uh, some uh, mathematical uh, uh, ones so now so the most important next important topic is linear programming because any because all of we know in optimization problem there are different kinds of optimization problems linear programming non linear programming uh, convex programming Uh, uh, quadratic programming, uh, integer programming, geometric programming, different kinds of mathematical programming models are available for optimization problems. But uh, if we if we define the Fuji uh, prob Fuji programming problem for linear programming only, then all are very similar. So in Fuji linear programming, how to represent the optimization problem? in fuzzy way so that is the most important issue so all of you know in general the fuzzy linear programming problem is mathematically represented in this form maximize uh, cj xj subject to aij xj less than equal to bi and xj greater than equal to 0 this is the general mathematical form of a linear programming problem so that means there is an objective function that is the maximizing function that is a linear function 
and there are some linear constraints. Uh, maybe there are n number of constraints, a m number of constraints, I'm sorry. And x, j are the decision variables. There are n decision variables. So here, a i, j, b i, and c, j, these are, in general, in deterministic linear programming problem, these are constant. But if we consider any one of those uh, input variables or input parameters are fuzzy in nature. That means aij or bij or maybe both aij bij or maybe cj, these are some fuzzy numbers. Then how to represent the corresponding model and how to solve it. So that is the most important issue here. Obviously, we can categorize uh, in uh, this fuzzy linear programming problem in different types. So obviously, the what are the type one problems? In type one problem, these are basically called fuzzy relational problems. That means we just look that can be divided into two ways. One is maybe the constraint, constraint uh, goals, or maybe the constraint inequalities are fuzzy. That means we can say x not uh, strictly, uh, not exactly less than equal to b, but more or less less than equal to b. That means maybe here, this is maybe some budget constraint. You have some budget uh, uh, within this 100 rupees. So you want to buy some uh, product uh, within 100 rupees. Here, 100 rupees is very fixed quantity. But if we consider this inequality as more or less 100 rupees, that may be 95 rupees, maybe in 105 rupees, maybe 100 rupees. That means in between 95 to 105. So this is not exact, not precise. This is imprecise. So that's why it is called imprecise resource. That means imprecise constraint. So similarly, maybe another category of fuzzy relational form. So or maybe the objective goal that is fuzzy. What is the objective goal? So maybe you want to make a business. Your target is per day uh, 1,000 rupees profit. Your target is fixed. But in general, in realistic system, that is not possible. 1,000 rupee profit, maybe someday 900 rupees, maybe in someday 110 rupees, that varies. So obviously, that constraint also, that means your objective goal, that may not be a fixed with 1,000 rupees. That may be between 900 to 1,000 rupees, or 1,100 rupees. That means this is another category of there may be the objective goal is fuzzy as well as constraint goal is fuzzy. That is represented in second category. And another type, second type, there may be any coefficient that is A, B, C, or both are fuzzy coefficient. In the first type of problems, only the right-hand side uh, parameter of the constraint are fuzzy. In the second category, only the coefficient of the objectives are fuzzy. In the third category, maybe the uh, right hand side parameter and left hand side parameter both are fuzzy and in uh, d all the parameters are fuzzy so in this way maybe we can categorize seven or eight types of problems but now the next topic is how to solve it so obviously we can differentiate the problem in different categories but how to solve it maybe uh, first we can discuss the type 2a 1a and 2a we just look 1a that means only the inequality 2a that means right hand side and 2b oh i'm sorry uh, 1a and 2a this is by using those simple approach that is known as vadige's approach so what is the concept here maybe the here maybe we consider a 1a problem or maybe to a problem, you just look the parameter B is fuzzy. So B is fuzzy means already I told you, you have uh, not 100 rupees, you would have maybe 100 plus rupees, but your target is with uh, around 100, maybe 95, maybe 105, no problem. So your target is you want to purchase the product by within 100 rupees, uh, by more or less 100 rupees. So that is, we can may represent that 
by a goal that is represented by a simple membership function if vx is within one within bi that means within 100 rupees obviously you are 100% satisfied because we can uh, purchase the amount purchase the product within 100 but it may be 100 plus that is also okay but that may be with not 100% satisfaction so that's why that membership may be gradually diminishing that means i just graphically just so if the membership value is less than bi then your membership value is one but if bi to bi plus pi then it is gradually diminishing that means your level of satisfaction that means you may up to reach 110 you are able to uh, uh, purchase the product up to 110 not more than that so that is your goal so that's why maybe within 100 to 110 the membership value is diminishing that means your level of satisfaction decreasing if it is within 100 you are fully satisfied because okay i purchased the product within 100 rupees but if it is 100 to 100 rupees then you are satisfied but your level of satisfaction is not 100 percent or not sure so that means it is little diminishing then you know okay so that means how to solve it because you just look we can solve it by very simple technique that is very sim very similar to the goal programming technique that we have used in uh, general optimization problem so what is the thing here in the first thing we solve the problem by considering aij is then equal to bi and in the second problem we considering the problem in aij xj less than equal to bi plus pi so uh, that means you consider two problem and solve it so in solving you get one problem your solution is jdl and another problem your solution is jdl because obviously in the first problem you know your solution is little less and the second problem your solution is that means your objective value is little high so that's why it is represented as jd because your goal is extended so according to that we can determine our goal so what is the goal function here one if obviously cx is less than equal to jd a jd is less than equal to cx and uh, obviously it is uh, <clears throat> goal is between uh, jdu and jdl then obviously it is um, cx minus jdl by jdu minus jdl and zero obviously if cx is less than jdl so actually our target is to maximize the function so obviously for maximizing the function so obviously it is increasing function so in this way we can represent the corresponding problem now obviously once you represent the goal so that means it is by using the membership function so you fudgeify your problem so now again you want to defudgeify it so how to defudgeify it you, this is the defudgeification part you maximize lambda subject to a gx greater than equal to lambda from these this is represented by this and if we simplify it ultimately you will get it so if we solve this mathematically you will get the corresponding solution so this is the concept of uh, this is the example i think this you can easily uh, recognize it suppose uh, you want to maximize it so you want to produce two kinds of uh, product uh, for the first product your profit is 0.4 dollar and for the second product your profit is 0.3 dollar so objective is this and your uh, goal is uh, your constraint is maybe the first constraint is the material constraint so you have uh, uh, x1 amount of first quality of first product and x2 is the second product so obviously x1 plus x2 less than equal to bi and maybe the second constraint is the another constraint maybe the labor hour constraint you have and you need uh, too many labor hours for the first product so 2x1 plus 2x2 less than equal to b2 so these b1 and b2 are the two fuzzy valued function so that is represented by this membership function 
So according to the graph in the previous slide, these are represented by this. So we can mathematically represent the problem one because you just look here, X is less than or equal to 400 and between 400 to 500. So for the first problem, we consider 400 and here X is less than or equal to 500. So here two X one less than or equal to 500. And you just look upper goal is 500 and 600. So for the second problem, you consider it is 500 and 600. So these two are deterministic problem. We solve it easily and we get uh, the solution. And maybe in the previous one, you just look by the same mathematical technique, we can Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, I think Sarah has lost the connection, oh, so no. we have to wait a few minutes. Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, yes sir. sir, you are now audible. Yes, uh, okay, okay, sorry. <clears throat> so actually, in uh, uh, stochastic optimization, there are uh, some other type of model. Actually, in the previous uh, slide, uh, up to previous slides, you just look. We consider some uh, uh, objective uh, coefficients. Hello. Hello, sir. Your screen is not visible. Okay. 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 Just a minute. Now it is okay? Hello? Sir, yes, sir. Okay. So uh, up to previous slides, you just look, uh, we considered some coefficients or some parameters considering fuzzy values or fuzzy variables. In that case, we use some uh, simple uh, mathematical technique. We, we transform those uh, uh, parameters into by using some membership functions. And finally, we transform those uh, fuzzy mathematical problem into some deterministic problem and solve it. 
there is another way because very similar way to stochastic programming in stochastic programming uh, some of you may know there there exists some expected value model there are some chance constant programming model and so on so there we have used some um, uh, mathematical technique or stochastic optimization technique by which we can solve so here also there are some techniques uh, by which we can solve some uh, expected value model chance constant programming model for fuzzy variable so obviously some mathematical part is there i'm not going to that part so what is the basic concept in stochastic programming in stochastic programming they use some uh, probability theory that probably uh, they use some uh, probability space and in, in by using that they use some random variable and then some probability distribution so here also because up to the previous slides we are not considering any um, fuzzy distribution so very similar way to the probability distributions people have defined some uh, possibility distribution people have defined some possibility theory and necessity theory so in possibility theory people have used by using some membership function so they define the possibility value so similarly they define the possibility space so what is the concept of possibility value actually the possibility function is basically the supremum of those that means here we use some possibility functions in this way that is represented by the right hand side curve similarly uh, people have uh, defined the necessity value necessity value is basically the uh, the uh, dual membership function of possibility function so that is one minus that but when people going for some mathematical theory by using this possibility theory they are have some trouble so then people define some credibility theory that credibility theory is basically the some uh, average measure of this possibility and necessity so that is some mathematical part so the mathematical form of that credibility theory is like this and then they define some expected value function so that expected value is mathematically represented by this zero to infinity credibility of x greater than equal to r dr minus minus infinity to zero zero credibility of x less than equal to r dr so once this expected value is defined and that is complete mathematical part is given so then people define some expected value model and chance constant programming model so that is little mathematical mathematical so but why that people uh, define that credibility theory so because there are some uh, difficulties for uh, possibility and necessity theory you just look here i have written the fuzzy event may fail even though its possibility achieve one so because possibility is always supremum so that means maybe there are some cases that always gives you the uh, possibility value one but uh, in realistic system that is not very true so that means you may the event is failed but you achieve one in some cases maybe the your event hold but you may achieve to zero so that's why people define the credibility theory because credibility theory is the average of necessity and possibility so that is some increasing functions because once in probability theory i think you, you it is clear so prob, prob, probability increasing that means your chances is increasing so, so but in the case of possibility theory possibility increasing means not your uh, similarity value is increasing but once the people have defined the credibility theory credibility increasing means similarity is increasing that is the most important issue here so that's why people define the credibility theory so now that expected value criteria is very similar to the stochastic criteria so you just look if we consider two uh, fuzzy variable like jai and eta if jai greater than eta people have proved that expected value is greater than eta jai is greater than eta then people define the objective functions as well as constant function and mathematical model is represented very similar to the um, stochastic model that means uh, stochastic expected value model and stochastic chance constant model similarly here for the case of uh, fuzzy theory people have defined expected value model as well as optimistic value model and max mean chance constant model so i am not going to that mathematical part because uh, time is more or less uh, over so so that uh, pessimistic value criteria so mean max chance criteria so that means here there are three different techniques one is expected value model 
another is a chance constant model and another is uh, dependent uh, pessimistic value criteria model and another is dependent chance constant um, model this is the dependent chance constant model so this is defined by um, professor boding liu uh, i am not going to the detail so finally another kind of problem that I'll, uh, that in uh, so uh, i told you that is uh, multi criteria decision making problem that is also very important uh, uh, problems which we can solve by using some fuzzy techniques so what is the concept of uh, that is basically developed by jimerman in 1978 jimerman extended the fuzzy linear programming approach the following multi objective linear programming problem approach hmm. so here this is new well hmm. uh, here the minimization of uh, k objectives subject to some constraints all the objectives is represented so now this is what the objectives is represented by some maybe some linear membership functions so um, here uh, for these the general mathematical form is this is again here we consider the max mean approach so by introducing this auxiliary variable lambda by this jimerman approach we can easily solve it so maybe one example i can give you here so considering maybe the bi objective problems here there are two objectives one is maximizing z is 3x1 plus 8x2 minimizing z is 5x1 plus 4x2 and subject to these three constraints and there the membership functions for one is represented by the mathematical way and another membership function another mathematical way and by using this jimerman technique we can uh, represent this mathematical model into a linear programming model and this is a deterministic linear programming model only one thing one extra variable is introduced here that is lambda and so initially it was two variable mathematical model here it is represented by three variable mathematical model and we can easily solve it so for this problem actually here all the parameters are deterministic so you look and we can easily solve it by simple uh, maybe by simplex method we can solve it so finally just look fuzzy multi criteria decision making problem may be categorized into two different techniques another is one is multi attribute decision making problem so in multi attribute i initially i gave you one example maybe you want to buy a car so obviously there are different alternative and these alternatives are uh, discrete alternatives so only you have two three alternatives you have three four criteria like uh, maybe uh, your uh, price of your car maybe comfort of your car maybe mileage of your car so these are the criteria so this type of uh, problems are called multi attribute decision making problems you have different alternatives you have different attributes or criteria and you can select the best decision and in the case of multi objective decision making problems you have different objectives a set of objectives different constraints here maybe your decision space is uh, continuous that means if your variables can take any values so here you can select the best optimal decision by using that mathematical technique so that fuzzy multi attribute decision making is defined by bellman and jade in 1970 and fuzzy multi objective decision making is determined by jimerman in 1976 78 so i am not going to the details there this is our problem actually we have already published two three papers in fuzzy multi criteria decision making problem maybe you can find it in uh, different journals the journal links is available here you can use different techniques for solve these multi criteria decision making problem this is another example one first one is for portfolio selection problem this is very well known problems in multi objective decision making problem another is uh, solid transportation problem that is also one uh, well known network optimization problem uh, with this i just conclude uh, today's uh, lecture so obviously when we uh, why this fuzzy optimization is important and why we consider these optimization problems so in general for any real life decision making problem the absolute certainty is difficult so that means most of the real life decision making problems there are some uncertainties or imprecision 
which can be tackled by stochastic approach or uh, uh, probability theory approach or fuzzy fuzzy theory based approach natural language that means that linguistic approach uh, is an in, uh, imprecise mode of expressing the concepts so that means that linguistic approach that means in general those type of uh, imprecision or uncertainties can be represented by some linguistic variables obviously the fuzzy theory is uh, able to apply that uh, to tackle such type of decision making situations or to design a mathematical uh, model for such type of decision making problems so obviously uh, due to the lack of insufficient information or lack of evidence maybe sometimes noise of data some statistical analysis uh, maybe we can use for various type of um, uh, problems like financial modeling supply chain modeling transportation systems and other types of optimization problems and in order to describe the extracts the usefulness of uh, information of the uncertainty based data and other things or sometimes one of the important uh, nowadays people have used some uh, type 2 fuzzy sets so for uh, maybe type 2 fuzzy sets is uh, handle or tackle more uncertain features so that's why that may be represented by some Uh, type two fuzzy sets. So that that that, that they, those are maybe the another future scopes. So with this, maybe I conclude. So this is the the final slide because some of you are interested to uh, uh, to solve some problems, some some real life decision problems by using fuzzy theory. In fuzzy theory, maybe develop in different ways. Maybe some mathematical uh, field. Maybe some fuzzy system fields. Maybe some decision making fields. maybe some uncertainty and information things maybe some artificial intelligence and fuzzy logic based approaches so fuzzy mathematical way people nowadays develop some fuzzy set theoretic development fuzzy relational forms fuzzy arithmetic fuzzy uh, majors fuzzy topologies etc in fuzzy systems people have defined fuzzy control fuzzy signal processing fuzzy communication mostly engineering problems are involved and fuzzy decision making approach maybe some decision making approach Uh, for management oriented pro problems maybe some optimization problems maybe multi objective maybe multi attribute decision making problems and uncertainty and information theoretical approach already i told you maybe the possibility and credibility approach for uncertainty majors and in some engineering problems people have used some logical uh, fuzzy logical approaches uh, through ai and machine learning tools so with this uh, these are some references uh maybe thank you very much for listening so if you have any questions maybe you can ask thank you hello thank you sir thank you for your magnificent speech on fuzzy optimization theory and decision making you gave us an insightful idea in decision making theory along with fuzzy optimization you discuss almost all the topic in very short time first start with basics of fuzzy theory and decision making and you discuss the difference between fuzzy theory and probability theory uh, the graphical representation of fuzzy sets etc and you also mentioned that uh, bellman and jade in the year 1970 first introduced the uh, basic concepts of fuzzy theory along with uh, you also discuss the how to formulate an optimization problem uh, for multi uh, multiple objects and multiple constraints thank you sir thank you for your uh, eminent speech now uh, i request dr uh, shankar prashad mondal sir to take up the session uh, the question answer session uh, sir please thank you anusha um, thank you dr samarjit sir for a nice presentation now uh, there is some here is some question uh, one participant ask that what is the difference between probability and fuzzy probability okay <laughs> so probability i think uh, maybe i am not i have already discussed why probability because uh, probability depends on chance and in uh, where we consider some uh, variable or parameters in Uh, decision making problems it is basically represented by distribution functions 
and there are some techniques uh, expected value models trans constant techniques by which we can solve okay so in uh, fuzzy uh, fuzzy probability obviously this is most important technique so in fuzzy probability is little different concept so then maybe sometimes we can say fuzzy probability sometimes probabilistic fuzzy so this maybe random fuzzy fuzzy random there are different but the conceptually when we hybrid when we do some hybridization of probability theory and fuzzy theory this is the most important point so maybe say i, I can give you a very simple way say maybe uh, in some cases you consider some probability distribution say suppose you have some normal distributions so i think all of you know what is normal distribution and normal distribution containing two parameters one is a uh, mean and standard deviation so suppose for any fuzzy distribution this mean and standard deviation not a fixed quantity sometimes some imprecision is there so that means mean maybe lies between uh, uh, 50 to 55 and 50 to 60 some standard deviation is lies between 10 to 15 like this so that means there are some imprecision that can be represented by some fuzzy membership function so that that may be a hybridization of randomness and fuzziness because any any real system that is represented by some uh, probability distribution where that distribution parameters are not very precise that distribution parameters are imprecise that is represented by some membership function in that case maybe you can say it is some random fuzzy uh, variable another way so maybe we can define some fuzzy uh, membership function that involves some parameters maybe some triangular fuzzy membership function it involves a b c three parameters sometimes those parameters are not very certain they are uncertain those uncertain parameters represented by some fuzzy membership function probability distribution so in that case maybe we can represent that is another type of hybridization so so that is very basic concept when we can use those terms random fuzzy fuzzy random those hybridization so in that case maybe we can define i think it is is onkar is this answer is uh, i think maybe uh, yes, sir, yes, okay sir. for okay for the participant yes sir yes sir yes sir. okay sir another question is here what is the disadvantages of fuzzy set theory so obviously <laughs> uh, there are some advantages some disadvantages the most important disadvantage is so how to represent the membership function obviously there are some techniques to represent the membership functions because for the membership function obviously we completely depend on the decision maker but that decision makers may be some bias the decision maker have some bias so that's why maybe your uh, the new result is completely incorrect in that case so obviously so you uh, obviously there are some uh, difficulties for taking those membership functions so representation of membership functions is the very important issue so in that case maybe we can have some problem so another thing so if you if you have a problem that maybe how to differentiate actually whether it is a fuzzy problem or probabilistic problem that uncertainty or imprecision that concept should be very clear to you otherwise if if there is a wrong concept in that case if we use fuzzy approach you will have the difficulty so these are the things so you have to choose the correct information and the correct approach you should apply okay sir okay ha huh. sir another question is what is fuzzy aggregation yeah fuzzy aggregation means so if you have if you if you have maybe in a uh, expert system based problems or maybe some decision making problems you not only have only one agree uh, only one rule or only one uh, criteria so you may have uh, different rules or maybe different criteria so how to combine those criteria or how to combine those rules so obviously if you you have to compose those rules or those criteria by using some mathematical technique so that is basically by using some union maybe some intersections or maybe the uh, joint of union and intersection like this so that is some composition rules because some of you have the concept of logic so a logical expression is 
connects by some logical connectives those logical connectives are intersection operator union operator implication operator uh, negation operators so in fuzzy logic also similar type of operators are there so those those operators connects those uh, uh, variables that is called aggregation fuzzy aggregation thank thank you sir another question is that what is numerical optimization and what is the basic difference between conventional optimization and numerical optimization so in conventional optimizations means basically you choose the appropriate technique so that means i think all of you have some idea about numerical techniques so basically numerical techniques we generally use some approximation and we develop some uh, theoretical concepts and check this convergence of that theoretical concept in numerical techniques so obviously when we use some classical gradient based approach then we can say the solution is optimal because classically we prove the optimality but in the numerical optimization technique we not always classically prove because in classical optimization you take first derivative is zero you take second derivative is positive or negative you can easily say the solution is maximum or minimum but in the case of numerical optimization you can use some numerical techniques like newton raphson method or other methods and we can show the solution is converging there is a converging criterion but we in general in numerical optimization we cannot get the exact solution we get also the near optimal solution so that is the basic difference between classical optimization and numerical optimization sir another question is uh, can we apply the fuzzy set theory in the real life problem of physics obviously so any kinds of real life problems because nowadays i think uh, maybe you can uh, all of you know that quantum physics is one of the important domain so maybe you can search you can find some uh, fuzzy quantum fuzzy quantum fuzzy techniques so this is the very real uh, applications of uh, fuzzy theory in physics so maybe you can find some quantum fuzzy papers also thank you sir thank you sir for yes. being a part of our fdp program uh, thank, thank you sankar so thank you all the organizing members for uh, giving me this opportunity obviously so thank you all thank you thank you sir okay okay thank you so maybe now i can just okay. Uh, okay sir thank you sir okay. thank you so much professor kaur sir for considering us from your valuable time now let us move uh, on our next lecture session thank you it is professor mathematics department of kolani university with about 20 years of teaching experience he has obtained various national as well as international awards and fellowship and many sorry he has more than 50 publications in various national and international journals his research interests are in mathematical biology and in population dynamics in particular today he will talk on the impact of microbial diseases of corals under macroalgal toxicity and overfishing professor pal sir kindly deliver your speech sir please hello yes sir you are yeah. audible <laughs> okay i ha <laughs> i have to sh uh, share my screen internet yes sir yes sir okay Yes, sir, your screen is sir visible.
is it okay hi is it okay sir can you sir make it full screen mode full screen okay okay yes sir it is now fine it's okay ha ah, yes sir yes sir okay. <clears throat> good evening to everyone uh first of all i like to thanks the organizer uh for giving me this opportunity to share my uh research with all of you also i like to thanks uh especially dr uh, shankar prasad mondon for inviting me here the title of my lecture is impact of microbial diseases of corals under microalgal toxicity and overfishing first i like to give a brief very preliminary introduction about the linear autonomous system we all know that uh, what is autonomous system uh, if the right hand side that is uh, uh, x1 and x2 both are dependent variable and t is independent variable if the right hand side does not contain t explicitly we call it autonomous system so we just uh, first consider this two dimensional autonomous system x1 dot is equal to ax1 plus bx2 and x2 dot equal to cx1 plus dx2 and for a b c d are all real and in matrix form we have x dot equal to a x where a is the coefficient matrix and we also assume that the determinant is non zero and by giving the transformation x equal to p y where p is non singular we can write this x dot equal to a x in the form y dot equal to j y where j is p inverse a p we know this kind of uh, transformation and this j is a diagonal matrix which has any one of the following three forms in first case j has two distinct real roots lambda 1 and lambda 2 in second case the two real roots are equal and in the third case it has complex roots alpha plus minus i beta in case one if the eigen values are real and distinct then uh, we can write the system in the form y dot equal to j y and this gives the simple ordinary differential equation y1 dot equal to lambda 1 y and y2 dot equal to lambda 2 y and its solutions are given by this Y i is equal to some c i times a to the power lambda i t, where c one and c two are arbitrary constants, and from this equation we can easily find that if lambda i are negative for all i, then y i tends to zero as t tends to infinity, and in this case the equilibrium point zero zero is said to be a stable node. We can easily find that. in both cases in figure 1 and figure 2 we see that all the trajectories they are approaching the equilibrium point 0 0 in this case and in this case depending upon which one is more negative in another case we can uh, say that if lambda i are positive then Y i tends to infinity as t tends to infinity, and in this case, zero zero is said to be unstable node. In this case, we can see that in both cases the trajectories are diverging from the equilibrium point zero zero. Uh, both trajectories are in the outward direction, and in this case, we can say that the equilibrium point zero zero is unstable. and uh, nature is known in another case we call that if 
Tiken Falun Sorofu sitting sign. In this case, if lambda 1 is negative and lambda 2 is positive, uh, then one trajectory tends to the equilibrium point and another one is diverging in nature. And in the neighborhood of zero zero, we can see the infinite number of trajectories which are approaching zero zero, but they are uh, just diverging from zero zero. And in this case, we can say that the equilibrium point zero zero is a saddle point, and of course, it is unstable. If the eigenvalues are complex in nature, then we can write the system in the form uh, this is the Jacobian, and we can write y1 dot and y2 dot in this form. We just uh, transform the system to a polar coordinate, and we get this. This is very simple mathematical calculations. And in this case, if alpha, that is the real part, uh, our uh, eigenvalues are alpha plus minus i beta. If alpha is negative and beta is negative, then in this case, the r, that is radius, decreases to zero in anti-clockwise direction as t tends to infinity. And in this case, we can say that the I equilibrium point zero, zero is a stable focus. And if alpha is negative, that is real part is negative and uh, beta is positive, then the motion is just clockwise direction, but both are uh, stable focus. Then in case of unstable focus, if alpha is positive, that is real part is positive, then uh, the equilibrium point is said to be unstable focus and in the that is, uh, this is uh, going out uh, outward direction, moving away from the equilibrium point zero zero. And if beta is positive, then the motion is clockwise. If beta is negative, then the motion is anti-clockwise. But in both cases, we can say that uh, that this is unstable focus. That is the trajectory going outward, going outward from its equilibrium point and we say that this equilibrium point zero zero is unstable but if the real part is zero we can say that this is just uh, gives us the concentric circles and we call that it is the center zero zero is the center and we call it neutrally stable And we can summarize all this result in the following uh, theorem that if we consider the system as x dot equal to ax, and if tau is the trace of the matrix A and delta is the determinant, and there are different cases and uh, this capital delta is the discriminant and depending upon uh, this delta and small delta, we can draw the different, we can represent the different situation in this figure that this parabola is tau square minus four delta. This is capital delta is equal to tau square minus four delta is equal to zero. And depending upon this discriminant and delta, we can find this region that in this region, this is unstable focus, this region is stable focus, and this is stable node, unstable node, and here it is saddle. And this is tau delta plane, this, uh, this is tau axis, and this is delta axis. Now come to the non-linear autonomous system. In case of non-linear autonomous system, uh, we consider a system x dot equal to fx, x belongs Rn, and f is smooth function, and uh, t does not appear explicitly on the right-hand side, and we call the system as autonomous. And if this f contains non-linear terms, then the system is said to be 
non-linear autonomous and we have uh, x bar is the equilibrium point of the system and we linearize of the non-linear system x dot equal to fx giving a small perturbation this j is equal to x minus x bar x bar is the equilibrium position and by using the Taylor's theorem we can write the system in the form this j dot is equal to d this d is the Jacobian uh, fx bar j. This is the linearized version of the system. This is the Jacobian matrix. And we simply consider uh, the autonomous non-linear system, very simple system, x dot equal to this and y dot equal to this. And we can easily find that 0, 0 is an equilibrium point of the system. And this V is the Jacobian matrix. And uh, this is the characteristic equation, and these are the eigenvalues, and we can uh, see that uh, this is of the form alpha plus minus i beta with negative real part. So as in our uh, previous theorem, we can say that this equilibrium point 0, 0 is a stable focus, and this is uh, a hyperbolic equilibrium. And this is uh, the stable focus that is all the trajectories tend to the equilibrium point zero, zero. This is for the linear system and this is for the non-linear system. There is some homeomorphism, homeomorphism that is uh, some topological equivalence between the two system, this linear system and non-linear system. And there is the theorem called hartmann grobman theorem. I just uh, want to mention that uh, we apply this theorem and we linearize the non-linear system. Now, a brief introduction about the population ecology. Population characteristics, we have uh, the population density. This is the number of organisms per unit area. Spatial distribution dispersion, the pattern of spacing a population within an area, and there are three main types of dispersion. One is clamped, another one is uniform, and another one is the random. And uh, the primary cause of dispersion is resource availability. That is, uh, due to this, the population move from one place to another. And the population limiting factor, population growth rate means how fast a given population grows. Factors that influence this area is natality, that is birth rate, mortality, the death rate, emigration, that is the number of individuals moving away from a population. And another one is immigration, the number of individuals moving to a population. Now this is density independent factor. Factors that limit population size regardless of population density, these are usually abiotic factors and they include natural phenomena such as weather events, drought, flooding, extreme heat or cold, tornadoes, hurricane. These are the density independent factors. Now the density dependent factors, these are mainly predation, disease, parasites, and competition. Now the first individual-based population model, we call it IBM. This is uh, described by uh, Leonardo Piano, nowadays commonly known as Fibonacci. Post, he posed a uh, question, but uh, we just consider that the behavior of the individuals and the population dynamics, if we denote the number of rabbit pairs at the reproductive priority by n suffix t, then we have this kind of difference equation, 
n t plus one equal to n t plus n t minus one. This is the uh, future time. This is the present time, and this is the past time. That is one, two, three. Which of course gives n zero equal to n one equal to one. The famous Fibonacci sequence gives us this. And Fibonacci himself did not give the solution uh, to this problem in a closed form, but explains how to iterate to process to achieve 377, the number of rabbit pairs after one year. Of course, the real beauty of the model lies in the ratio of successive Fibonacci number. This ratio, nt over nt plus one, this is approximately root over five minus one, all divided by two for large t, and this ratio is called golden mean. Another very important model in Lotka Voltera's model in ecology. This is the model that n is the number of density of prey population and p is the number of uh, density of predator population. And this is the rate of growth. This is the growth rate. Uh, and this r is the growth rate of prey in absence of predator. n is the number of, n is the prey density and p is the predator density. This is the growth of prey population in absence of predator. And this is the, uh, attacking rate by predator on prey population. So the growth of prey population reduces this one. And this is the uh, conversion. This is the growth of predator population due to uh, predation on the prey species. And this is the death of predator population in absence of prey population. And graphically, we can say that uh, this is the prey population and this is the predator population. Uh, when the prey population at the maximum level, predator at the lower level, and this decreases and this increases, and this kind of oscillation we observe. Another one is the disease. Uh, we have two terms. One is epidemic and another one is endemic. Epidemic is an event during which an infection sweeps through a population and endemic is the time invariant space with the infection present in the host population. This is uh, now very common term, susceptible and infected population. Susceptible, a member of the host population is classified as susceptible if they are not infected and are capable of being infected. Infective, the number of host population is classified as infective if they have been infected and are infectious and removed. A member of the host population is classified as removed if they are unable to take part in the transmission of infection, either because they are no longer infectious and have become immune. Sometimes they have been vaccinated and sometimes even they are dead. So, and another class is exposed class, they are infected, but are not yet infectious. So this is uh, the compartmental model in epidemic we have mainly the susceptible, infective, removed, and exposed class. This is the simple basic model of epidemics. This is the susceptible class. I have already defined what is susceptible and uh, they, are, they become infected. And this is beta is the rate of infection or force of infection and this is the infected class and uh, individuals, they uh, enter into the recovered class. And this is the rate 
of recovery. This is a very uh, simple model, basic model in our epidemics uh, that this is the DSTT. This is the susceptible, uh, S is the susceptible class. This is the minus beta SI. This uh, beta is the transmission rate. And this DI, I is the infective class and R is the recovered class. So. Uh, infected individuals become uh, immune and they enter into the recovered class, this R. And another important term is the basic reproduction number. And this basic reproduction number of an infectious disease is defined as the number of secondary cases that would arise due to introduction of a single primary case into a fully susceptible population. And in our previous slide, we can easily find that uh, <coughs> epidemic uh, persists if the infected class, this GIDT, is positive. So we can easily calculate this beta SI uh, minus gamma I is positive, and this one is R0 is beta s by gamma, this ratio, just this ratio, beta s minus gamma is positive. So if R0 is greater than one, then there will be an epidemic. And if R0 is less than one, then the disease will die out. So for an epidemic, we must have R0 is greater than one. And this implies there is a minimum size of the population in which there can be an epidemic. So in that case, we can see that this beta, this, this one, that is this S, initially S is N. N is the total population size. So N must be greater than gamma over beta. So for an epidemic, there must be uh, a, a minimum size of the population and this side is gamma over beta. Now, uh, the amalgamation of ecology and epidemiology. Uh, this is the general prey, predator prey model. This is, and this is the epidemic model. And this N is the prey population and P is the predator population. This is the growth of prey population. And this is the predation uh, and this is the functional response. And this is the death of the prey population. And this is the transformation or conversion, this from prey class. And this is the death. And in case of <coughs> epidemic model, this is susceptible class. And this is infected class. And this is. Uh, <coughs> the susceptible uh, recruitment in, into the susceptible class. And this is the transmission from susceptible class to infected class. And this is the death due to infected population, death due to infection. And this is uh, the ecological part. And this is the epidemic, uh, epidemic model. And these two can be merged and we call it eco-epidemiological model. And this is the susceptible class, this is the infected class, and this is the predator population. And due to infection, we consider that the susceptible population, that the total population is divided into two classes. One is susceptible class and another one is the infected class. And this is the growth of infection and this K, we call it carrying capacity. And this is the infection. And this is the transmission rate from susceptible to infected class. <coughs> and this part is the predation, uh, predation by predator class on susceptible population. And this is the infected class. This one is the uh, 
transmission from susceptible to infected class and this is the predation and this is the death and we consider that due to predation uh, by predator class on infect uh, on on uh, infected class there is some uh, negative effect in the growth rate of negative effect in the growth rate of predator class and this is the death of predator and this is uh, this is the predation uh, on susceptible class so it actually uh, helps to the uh, growth of predator class and here there are different functional response first one is the Holling type one uh, this is the simple linear growth as and this is Holling type two is as over one plus ahs there is a saturation and this actually tends to one as t tends to infinity and this is Holling type three uh, a s square over one plus a h s square and another one is the ratio dependent uh, divided by the total population that is uh, prey and predator population now we come to the our main part that is the impact of macroalkyl toxicity and overfishing on coral reef ecosystem. And this is the brief biological overview of coral reef. The coral reef ecosystem is the diverse collection of species that interact with each other and the physical environment. It is the essential feeding and breeding ground for numerous organisms. And the Sun is the essential source of energy for this ecosystem. I'd like to define uh, some uh, but, um, turf algae. This is the multi-specific assemblage of microalgae that attain a canopy height of only 1 to 10 millimeter. And the macroalgae are larger. Canopy height is usually greater than 10 millimeter. Erect algae often with anatomically complex forms and corals settle on turf algae. Macroalgae spread vegetatively over turf algae. And high macroalgal biomass can interfere with coral recruitment and reduce coral survival. And there is a symbiotic relationship between uh, Juanthelia and coral polyps. The most important fact is that the coral polyps they do not photosynthesize but have a symbiotic relationship with single-celled organism called juanthelia living inside the coral polyp tissues and through photosynthesis juanthelia produces oxygen and carbohydrates for coral polyps and in return coral polyps produces carbon dioxide and ammonia for juanthelia now, the main cause of concern, we all know that, is the coral bleaching. It is the result of disruption of this symbiotic relationship between juanthelia and coral host. We have identified, uh, and it is also uh, established from different literature, that there are mainly two reasons behind this coral bleaching. One is due to macroalgal toxicity, and this is uh, the toxin released by macroalgae increases the mortality rate of corals and during this harmful algal bloom, large areas of corals become depleted. And another cause of concern of coral bleaching is uh, due to the overfishing. In absence of herbivorous parrotfish, there is a rapid increase of growth of seaweeds and coral polyps are smoothed to death by this rapid growth of algal mats resulting to coral bleaching. Another term is the phase shift. Coral reefs can relatively undergo rapid changes in dominant biota, and this phenomena is termed as phase shift. 
and this degradation of coral reefs is often associated with changes in community structure towards macroalgal dominated reef ecosystem due to the reduction in herbivore caused by overfishing. And we investigate this coral macroalgal phase shift due to the effects of harvesting of herbivorous reef fish by means of a continuous time model as uh, I have already shown in simple prey predator type model. Now the hysteresis uh, in ecology. In ecology, ecosystems can exist under multiple alternative steady states and under external perturbations, this ecosystem exhibit phase shift. Now, the threshold for a shift of regime and for its reversal can become different and this phenomenon is termed as hysteresis. The occurrence of hysteresis gradually destroy the resilience, uh, I shall dis uh, discuss the term resilience of coral dominated regime. What is resilience? Resilience is the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to still retain essentially the same function, structure and identity. And there are some crucial aspects of resilience. One is latitude, another one is resistance, and, and third one is the precariousness. And I shall show in my model that uh, how these three aspects affect on the system in our, uh, on our ecological system. And uh, there are two kinds of resilience. One is ecological resilience and another one is the engineering resilience. Ecological, the main difference between ecological and engineering resilience is that in case of ecological resilience, there is only, uh, there is a multiple attractor, but in case of engineering resilience, there is a single attractor. And uh, the significance of using resilience in our model, we have introduced resilience to show how much time is taken by the system to restore with different values of toxicity and harvesting after getting water. And the second one, it is observed that with high toxicity level, the system takes more time to recover after getting part up by coral depletion. This is uh, one of the most crucial aspects in our model that uh, with high toxicity level, the system takes more time to recover. Uh, that is, returns back to its original fund. Our uh, basic assumption, M is the macroalgae, T is the turf algae, and macroalgae grows on turf algae, and C is the coral. And this is the growth of macroalgae. This is the immigration And uh, macroalgae grows faster than corals. So, and this G1 is the depth, and this is the grazing term. Grazing by uh, herbivorous reef fish on macroalgae. And this beta is the reduction in grazing due to harvesting. So when there is no harvesting, that is beta is equal to zero, this is the complete grazing and uh, for higher values of beta, this, graz this grazing term uh, reduces. And this actually plays a crucial role in our model. And this is the turf algae. And this gamma, this is the effect of macroalgal toxicity because macroalgae release toxic chemicals. And this is the reduction of um, corals. This is the reduction of corals due to this algal toxicity. 
we can simplify our model and uh, there is some kind of conservation that is if we add these three equations this becomes cheap this one so uh, we can reduce the system to a uh, three dimensional system to a two dimensional one and we consider that this macroalgae this is the initial condition this is positive and this is also positive under this assumption and equilibria this is very simple that if we take this dm dt is equal to zero and dc dt equal to zero and by solving uh, the equations we can get these two equilibrium values one is uh, coral free equilibria this is the macroalgae and this is coral one is coral free equilibria and another is the uh, coexistence equilibrium and uh, i'm not going into details of this mathematical calculations and stability analysis i have already discussed uh, about how we can uh, calculate uh, how we can draw the conclusion uh, about stability of the system around an equilibrium point, uh, just finding the eigenvalues. Though in this case, it is not very simple, but uh, uh, the basic idea is same as in the previous case that asymptotically stable if this gamma is the uh, toxicity level of toxicity and this gamma star is the some threshold value so if this gamma is greater than uh, this gamma star that is for high toxicity level we can say th uh, that corals are eliminated from the system and in case of coexistence equilibria because we can remember that we have two equilibria one is coral free equilibria and another one is the coexistence this uh, coexistence equilibria is most important one of course uh, so in case of coexistence equilibria there is some uh, restrictions uh, so that this coexistence equilibria is asymptotically stable and we can find the non-existence of periodic solutions and we use the Dulac functions. Uh, this is very uh, straightforward. Now, we observe there is the transcritical bifurcation at the coral free equilibria E0 because in this case, we can easily find that one eigenvalue is equal to zero. If this is the Jacobian matrix, so we can say that one eigenvalue is equal to zero. So, we can uh, say that, and by simple mathematical calculations, we can find that, uh, the system undergoes a transcritical bifurcation at the coral free equilibria when the toxicity level crosses some threshold value gamma star. Another kind of bifurcation is the sad note bifurcation. And we observe this sad note bifurcation at the coexistence equilibria E star. I'm not going into details of these mathematical calculations. And the main difference between transcritical bifurcation and sad uh, node bifurcation is that in both cases, one uh, this is of course a two dimensional system, one eigenvalue must be equal to zero. And in transcritical bifurcation, when the system moves from one steady state to another, the previous one exists unstable. But in case of certain node bifurcation, one eigenvalue is equal to zero. Then in this case, in case of certain node bifurcation, 
the previous state does not exist. And we observe hysteresis, uh, this, this actually uh, two threshold value, one is gamma substar and another one is gamma star. And this is our parameter values for numerical simulation. We actually estimated uh, these two, this gamma that is toxin induced death rate and another one is the beta that is hardest mediated grazing loss. And this is the transcritical bifurcation. We can easily find that this is the threshold value gamma sub star and this is E0, that is coral free equilibria, and this is uh, <coughs> E star, and this is the determinant value. And at this point, this determinant value is zero because one eigenvalue is equal to zero. Uh, because we know that this determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. So this is the unstable branch and this is the stable branch. And this is the trace value, that is sum of the eigenvalues. And this is, and at this gamma star, gamma sub star, this determinant is zero and trace is negative with instability at E naught for gamma less gamma star. That is when the toxicity level is less than some threshold value, gamma sub star, then E naught is unstable. That is for low toxicity level, the system is stable at the coexistence equilibria and it is unstable at the coral free equilibrium. And stability at E0 when gamma is greater than gamma star, gamma substar. That is when the toxicity level is greater than this threshold value, gamma substar, that is for higher toxicity level, the system is stable at the coral free equilibria. So higher toxicity level, uh, in case of higher toxicity, uh, the system is stable at the coral free equilibrium. And there is a sad note bifurcation at gamma star. This is gamma star. That is when the toxicity level below this threshold, below this threshold, then the system is locally asymptotically stable at the coexistence equilibrium point. And crossing this gamma star, then we observe that this, the system is stable at the coral free equilibria. And uh, we can see that in this region, the coexistence equilibria does not exist at all. And this is the determinant value and this is the trace value. And this is the bifurcation diagram of gamma. Uh, gamma is the toxicity level and this is the coral cover. And actually there are three zones in zone one, zone two, and zone three. In zone one, that is when the toxicity level below this threshold gamma sub star, then the system is monostable at the coexistence equilibria. In between these two thresholds, that is gamma st sub star and gamma star, the system is bistable. That is, this is the uh, stable branch and this is the unstable branch. And for higher toxicity level, the system is monostable at the coral free equilibrium. And we can just uh, uh, split this diagram in three parts, zone one, zone two, and zone three. So in zone one, that is for lower, uh, low toxicity level, all the trajectories tend to the coexistence equilibria, E star. And in zone two, that is uh, where the 
um, we observe by stability that is depending upon the initial conditions some trajectories tend to the coexistence equilibria and some trajectories tend to the uh, coral free equilibria and in zone 3 that is for higher toxicity level all the trajectories tend to the coral free equilibria and we can observe this is for uh, the previous uh, figure is for the bifurcation diagram for the toxicity level and we observe the same kind of bifurcation in case of g g is the grazing grazing by herbivores on uh, macroalgae so for lower grazing that is below this threshold then in this case the coexistence equilibria does not exist for higher grazing that is grazing by herbivores on macroalgae we observe uh, the local asymptotic stability at the coexistence this is the determinant value and this is the trace value and this is the transcritical bifurcation and this is the bifurcation diagram of g this is the grazing intensity and this is the coral cover and we observe there are three zones this is for lower grazing uh, we observe the system is monostable at the coral free equilibria and in between g sub star and g star we observe by stability at coral free equilibria and coexistence equilibria and for higher grazing that is higher grazing by herbivores on macroalgae so it gives more space to corals and in this case uh, only the coexistence equilibria is stable and this is the basin of attraction and uh, this is the macroalgae dominated resin and this is the coral dominated so for lower grazing the system is macroalgae dominated and for higher grazing the system is coral dominated and this beta beta is the hardest mediated uh, reduction in grazing and in this case, we observe for lower harvesting, the system is bistable at the coral free equilibria and coexistence equilibria. And for higher harvesting, the system is stable uh, at the coral free equilibria. So harvesting has a negative effect on this system. And this is the basin of attraction for in or and Easter, that is, uh, when there is no harvesting, the system is coral dominated and when there is uh, higher harvesting, the system is macroalgae dominated. And from this, uh, we can say that with low macroalgal toxicity, the system becomes stable at the coral dominated level. And increase of the toxicity level below a certain threshold determines two possible stable uh, resins depending upon the initial conditions that is by stability with high macroalgal toxicity coral depletes completely and the system becomes stable at the coral free equilibria with high macroalgal toxicity increase of grazing rate increases the resilience i shall uh, show this resilience in my next uh, model of the coral dominated resin with high macroalgal grazing rate by herbivores, increase of macroalgal growth rate on algal top increases the resilience of the coral dominated. Uh, our next one is on disease dynamics. Microbial disease in coral reefs. This is another cause of concern of coral bleaching. It has been observed that reef building corals, reef building coral species are susceptible to influences of black band disease, we call it BBD. Uh, 
characterized by cyanobacteria dominated microbial mat that migrates rapidly across infected corals, leaving empty coral skeleton. This one is uh, healthy, this is disease. And this is the schematic diagram of our model. This is the tarp algae on which macroalgae and coral grow. And this is, uh, we can remember about the eco-epidemiological model that is the total, uh, due to infection, the total coral population is divided into two classes. One is susceptible corals and another one is the infected corals. And we have considered the two kinds of infection. One is contagious and another one is the non-contagious. That is, one is by contact and another one is by way of another means, uh, suppose by coralivorous fish. So uh, we have considered two kinds of infection and this uh, the total coral population is divided into two classes susceptible and infected corals. And another class is macroalgae class. And we have considered uh, growth, mortality in our model. This is the eco-epidemiological model. This is the mathematical model in presence of black band disease. I have already mentioned that due to this disease, the total coral population is divided into two classes susceptible corals, CS, and infected corals, CI. And the rate of infection through contact, that is through, uh, that is through contagious infection. This is lambda. This one is lambda. And the rate of infection through non-contagious pathway, that is independent of density of infected corals, that is eta. This one is eta. So this is the macroalkal growth. This is the uh, tar algae, and this is susceptible corals, and this is infected corals. So this is our four-dimensional model. And as in our previous model, we observed some kind of conservation. So in this case also, we can observe that if we add these four equations, this becomes zero. So we can reduce the system to a three-dimensional one. I shall not go into details of these mathematical calculations. And uh, <coughs> we observe there are mainly two equilibria. One is coral free equilibria, that is macroalgae dominated equilibria. And another one is the uh, coexistence equilibria. And we observe the different conditions for asymptotic stability at coral free equilibria, this eta, eta is the rate of infection through non-contagious pathway. So if the rate of infection through non-contagious pathway is greater than some threshold, then we can say that the system becomes stable at the coral free equilibrium. And we observe that transcritical bifurcation at the coral free equilibria of persistence and uh, stability at, at coexistence equilibria. And we also observe some hop bifurcation. And there is the sad, we observe there is a uh, sad note bifurcation. I have already explained this uh, kind of bifurcation. And this is our parameter values uh, for numerical simulation. And we actually uh, estimated these three parameters. This gamma is the disease-induced death rate. This lambda is the rate of infection uh, through contagious pathway. And eta is the rate of infection through non-contagious pathway. And we can uh, uh, see that this eta is the rate of infection through uh, non-contagious pathway. So when the rate of infection is greater than this threshold value, eta star, then the system 
is stable at the coral pre equilibria and when the rate of infection is less than this value then the system is monostable at the coexistence point and this is the bifurcation diagram with eta eta is the rate of infection uh, through non contagious pathway and this is the coral copper and we have observed there is actually this is the side node bifurcating point lp limit point and this is the transcritical bifurcating point bp branch point and we observe that these two coincide at the point which is called cusp point and in between in this region we observe hysteresis but uh, uh, after this cusp point we observe no hysteresis so here we observe the bistability and uh, and here the system is monostable that is uh, when the rate of infection through non contagious pathway is higher than this value then the system is monostable at the coral free equilibrium and this g is the grazing rate if we increase the grazing rate in this way and here this is the branch point this is the cusp point this is zero hop uh, this is the bogdanov stackens bifurcation and i am not going into details of this and this is the coexistence region in eta g g is the grazing rate and this eta is the rate of infection through non contagious pathway that is for higher grazing the system uh, is coral dominated and for lower grazing and with rate of infection the system is macroalgae dominated And this is the uh, bifurcation diagram with eta. Eta is the non contagious pathway, infection through non contagious pathway. And this is R. R is the recruitment rate of corals. Uh, and we observe this kind of bifurcation diagram. Yes. This is, uh, we can observe the three main. Uh, components of resilience this is the immigration rate of macroalgae b and this is coral copper and here we observe three region that is immigration rate is lower than this value then the system is monostable at the coexistence equilibria in between these two values we observe bistability and for higher immigration rate, we observe the system is monostable at the coral free equilibrium. And here we can see that this is the resilience, that is, this is uh, R resistance, this is precariousness, and this is the uh, latitude component. And when these three coincides at this point, then the system bifurcates. This is the coexistence region in lambda. Lambda is the rate of infection through contagious pathway. Uh, that is for higher rate of infection through contagious pathway, the system is uh, macroalgae dominated. And for lower rate of infection, the system is coral dominated. And this is the bifurcation diagram of G, grazing, grazing by uh, herbivores on corals. That is, for higher grazing, the system is monostable at the coexistence equilibrium. And we observe this is the oscillatory region, and this is monostable. This is bistable region, and this is again monostable. That is, for lower grazing, the system is monostable at the coral free equilibrium. And this is the hop bifurcation curve. 
and in between two uh, hop bifurcation, we observe this kind of oscillatory region. And from this, our observation is that the system exhibits two stable configurations of the community under same environmental conditions with satellite bifurcations and associated hysteresis effect when the dazing rate of RB force and disease transmission rate cross some certain threshold. And the effect of grazing on hysteresis supports the observation from previous modeling analysis by Blackwood, Mambi, and uh, Fang, and different researchers. In absence of macro algal immigration, no hysteresis is observed. This to justify the consideration of macroalkyl dispersal in our system. And the system exhibits a certain change of trans transition associated with satellite bifurcation and hysteresis effects when the immigration rate of macroalgae cross some certain threshold. And uh, Dr. Jaydev Bhattacharya is now in a college and the funding from SERP. And these are some references. And thank you all. Thank you so much, Professor Pal sir, for your insightful ideas on the impact of microbial diseases of porous under macroalgal toxicity and overfishing. In your lecture session, you beautifully described the competition between microalgae and porous for occupying the available space in the seabed, which is an important ecological process underlying the uh, underlying the coral reef dynamics. Also discuss about your research ideas on this study. Now, uh, we shall take some question answer session. So I would like to request Dr. Uh, Shankar Prashad Mondal sir to take over the question answer session. Sir? Thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Pal sir, for giving a nice presentation on the ecological modeling related problem. So here is some question from the participants end. So the first question is, uh, what is the difference between MATLAB or Mathemat and Mathematica for dealing with a nonlinear dynamics model? Actually, in our case, we uh, have mainly used MATLAB. Uh, and in some cases, we have used MathCont, but we have not used uh, Mathematica, but uh, uh, it also uh, gives you a very good result also. But uh, we are actually um, very much, uh, uh, we very much uh, frequently used uh, mainly MATLAB. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Next question is, what is the difference between statistical modeling and mathematical model yes actually uh, here uh, we have used non-linear ordinary differential equations and we have uh, analyzed the system we have made uh, first calculated equilibrium points then stability and then we have verified our model with numerical simulations but in case of statistical modeling, it is mainly based upon the data sets, data sets available. So in case of statistical modeling, first you have to get the data and based on that, you have to uh, draw a model. But in our case, it is uh, uh, that first we uh, draw a model and then we use data. This is the main difference. Thank you, sir. And the next question is, what is the stability term stands for in a ecological model? Yes, stability means uh, uh, first uh, we calculate equilibrium points. So you will get uh, that, suppose D and DT, D and DT is equal to zero. 
at any instant of time. So you will get some fixed value, okay? So at this fixed value, you can find whether the system is stable at this equilibrium point. This is just, uh, you can use in case of simple model, you can use the perturbation method. That is, we simply part up our equilibrium point from uh, by a small perturbation and check the uh, whether the it returns back to its initial position. If it returns back to its initial position, we call it the system is stable and otherwise it is unstable. Thank you, sir. Next question is where we get statistical data. Sorry. Where we get the statistical oh, data statistical for biological data. research? Uh, actually, mm, uh, suppose in present uh, pandemic situation, you have to collect the statistical data from different sites, different websites, different hospitals, or, diff uh, or uh, there are some web pages from which you can get uh, this kind of data. Uh, but there are some divisions that you can get uh, from some web pages, some uh, websites, data for ecological or some epidemiological models or, uh, epidemiolo or, or different diseases. You will get from. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. Uh, sir. Next question is that can you please specify the level of uh, herbivorous? We support coexistent equilibrium. Level of herbivorous. Hi, herbivorous, which support coexistent equilibrium. Yes. Actually, herbivorous. Uh, uh, herbivorous, actually, uh, in our case, this is herbivorous fish. Okay. Uh, the name is uh, in our model it is parrot fish okay so parrot fish they consume on herbivores and especially on algae okay and in this case it is macroalgae so herbivorous reef fish means uh, this kind of fishes they consume on macroalgae so we call it herbivorous reef fish and uh, it is actually very essential, very, uh, they play a very significant role in our uh, coral ecosystem because they actually predate on macroalgae. And uh, the main problem is that macroalgae suppress the growth of corals. So if herbivores present in the system, so they diminish the growth of macroalgae and uh, the system is stable. Uh, Thank you, sir. Next question is, uh, what is the dimensionless concept in a mathematical biology problem? Yes, dimensionless uh, means uh, we actually in our model, uh, there are many parameters. Okay, so uh, there is uh, one theorem called Buckingham Pi theorem. In this case, we can reduce the number of number of parameters to a certain degree. Okay, so if we just uh, reduce the number of parameters in a certain uh, system by way of uh, uh, by using the theorem I just mentioned that it is called Buckingham Pi theorem. So we call it uh, dimensionless or uh, Air dimensionalize or non dimensionalize uh, system. Thank you. The next question is Is the real data need for validation of model for a research paper? Yes, but it is very difficult to get uh, hmm, real data. So sometimes we have to. Uh, collect some data from different papers or previously published some research papers or some 
um, those who have already uh, done some kind of experiments on this kind of model. So um, we have to collect this kind of data uh, because we do not, uh, um, uh, we actually do not uh, perform any kind of experiment in our lab. We actually collect data uh, from different literature or different published uh, papers. Thank you, sir. Next question is how machine learning or artificial intelligence can be used in mathematical biology problem? Yes, uh, it's a very good question, actually. Actually, we have not yet used uh, this kind of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, but uh, this can be done. But in this case, uh, um, this kind of simple OD type model uh, is not applicable. In, uh, and you have just, uh, one of the participants just asked me about the statistical uh, modeling. So in that case, we can use uh, this kind of artificial intelligence or um, machine learning uh, in that kind of model. So we have to modify our model. Uh, in this case, you cannot use. The next question is, what is the future of ecological research? in present day status? Oh, uh, uh, we can easily find that uh, in nowadays, that is in this uh, pandemic situations, uh, different mathematical models, uh, they are trying to uh, predict about how long uh, the disease will persist, when uh, it will go down because uh, I have uh, shown uh, two important parameters that is basic reproduction number. That is when the basic reproduction number is less than one, uh, then the disease will be under control. But uh, in uh, this situation, it is very difficult uh, to get uh, the actual data uh, because uh, there are some limitations and we observe that uh, so in most of the cases, this kind of mathematical models fail uh, to predict uh, that when the disease will be under control. But uh, when you have nothing, that is when do not know, you have no uh, vaccine or nothing, then this kind of mathematical models gives you uh, an overview about uh, this kind of uh, uh, epidemic or this is in case of epidemic but and in case of ecological systems uh, I think it's same same we can draw the same conclusion that this will give you an overview an idea about uh, how the different species interact so the next question is uh, how MATLAB draw a picture from the differential equation is it yes uh, yes use uh, numerical computation or numerical uh, approximation actually uh, there is a different kind of uh, od45 or um, uh, inbuilt programs but you have to modify that uh, uh, programs according to your uh, uh, that uh, what kind of uh, actual results you want so you have to modify the inbuilt program and uh, there we mainly use OD45 uh, for this kind of uh, ordinary differential equations. Uh, sir, one question is here, same similar type of question that how can we get real ecological data that validates our model? Uh, I have uh, just mentioned that hmm, it is similar uh, type. Difficult, but uh, mm, uh, because people who mm, actually perform this kind of experiment, so uh, they will not simply supply you the real data. So uh, you have to collect if it is in uh, if it is available in websites, in web pages. But uh, in some cases, this is we call it. Uh, raw data. Raw data is available, but you have to uh, 
manage it uh, according to your needs. Thank you, sir, for answering the questions. And thank you from our side, the, that is the organizing committee. That thank you for uh, being a part of our FDP program. Thank you, sir, again. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Now, over to you, Ms. Arnesha. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we are uh, at the end of the session. Thank you all our resource person for considering us from their scheduled time. And also on behalf of our university, I like to thank our participants for being with us. Now, uh, and also we are looking forward for your active participation for tomorrow's session also. Uh, now we are going to close this session. Uh, thank you. And good night to all. Good night. So we are closing this session. Yes, sir.